general order the public hearing for uh, to solicit public comments on the town plan. Um, this is uh, one of two meetings. The second one will be at the beginning of the select board meeting on September 13th, where additional comments will be solicited and, and uh, possibly, depending on the nature, incorporated into the plan. I'll open it up to the floor. Uh, any comments on the town plan? Yes, sir. And uh, when we call on you, please state your name so that way we can have it for the record. <laughs> yeah, my name is uh, George Holt uh, Randolph. Can I approach the uh, the board to give, give a hand out to you? Please, go Start, uh, I just wanted to say the, uh, the revised plan that I thought was uh, outstanding. Uh, the, the planning committee did a, a great job. What I liked about it especially was uh, Section 8, which was the implementation of the plan. They have specific tasks, you know, each one of the goals that are in the plan itself. And I thought that was a good departure from the current plan. Uh, some suggestions for further improvement. Uh, I've, I've designed a couple of uh, covers for the town plan. Uh, you'll see that right underneath there. The, the current cover is kind of kind of bland, but this may be more eye-catching. I can revise that any way you want if you want a different photo in there. But the reason I did that, we talk a lot about our, our capabilities, our strength, uh, um, economic as well as cultural, education, and the arts. Uh, but there's, uh, there's some mention of our, of our farming capability. So I think this will add, you know, that we've also got strength in farming in Randolph. The, uh, the second comment I have is the, uh, the introduction. Right now we have a chapter, it's called Chapter 1, and it's also called Introduction. Uh, you might want to consider having an introduction up front before uh, the Chapter 1, okay? And what I would recommend is uh, something that would really go into uh, what we're proud of in Randolph. And we, you know, we can talk about our educational institutions. Uh, we can talk about cultural assets, and we can talk about recreation. There is something in the current plan uh, similar to this, but it was uh, outdated in some respects. And what I did, I took out all of the non-relevant items and redid it uh, like this. So I'm recommending that we have a separate introduction and have this as the lead-in to the plan. There's some, uh, there was some discussion about uh, you know, what a plan is supposed to incorporate. As far as I can tell, we've done everything what the Vermont uh, requirement uh, says should be in a plan. Okay? Uh, the reason I'm saying uh, this introduction is good up front, I think we ought to get rid of the current chapter one. Okay? We talk about all of the requirements for a plan, and that's good while you're building the plan, but once the plan is built, uh, it's not really necessary to carry that up front. I would recommend putting that as an, as an appendix. Those are the legal requirements. The, the other thing is uh, there was some comment about, uh, you know, are photos really appropriate to be in a town plan? And I looked at a, a dozen town plans from other uh, towns around. Uh, you'll see in there one from Essex and one from Hubbardton. And uh, the Essex town plan has something like uh, 65 photos throughout the entire plan. And they've got a really nice cover. It's got a lot of, of photos on it. The Hubbardton plan, uh, uh, that's a town that's only about one-third the size of Randolph. And yet they go into photos quite a bit. 
Uh, you'll see their, their cover photo and also uh, they highlight one of their strengths. And that's the Hubbardton uh, Battlefield. You know, that's what they're famous for. <coughs> As far as other comments uh, inside the plant itself, you may want to take a look at the Vermont Technical Enterprise Center. It's mentioned uh, in a number of places throughout the plant. But I understand VTC is trying to get rid of that property. So it may not be relevant once the, the plan gets, uh, gets uh, published. The other thing is uh, the Randolph Economic Development Council. Uh, but, but all we say in the Economic Development Chapter, Chapter 8, is you know we're going to hope that the council continues to do good things, basically. Okay, but there's not really any guidance, you know, what the council should do. Uh, the current plan had an attachment to uh, Chapter 8, Economic Development, and that was passed to the beginning of the Economic Development Council back in 2012. Uh, the last item you have in there is what that attachment to Chapter 8 uh, was, the Economic Development Council guidance. I'd recommend that you uh, provide this once again uh, to the council. I'll amend it as appropriate. There's a lot of things that's, that's discussed in there. You know, we talk about possible tax incentives for new businesses. Uh, we talk about uh, what was called an ombudsman at the time, and that person was to speed up the permitting process. You know, they can walk new companies right on through the process to get them started. Right now, they, they, they have to do it on their own. It's a little bit tiresome. Okay? And uh, there's a, a lot of other good things in that. So it's up to the board if you want to pass that on to the uh, Economic Development Council for further guidance. Okay. That's all I have, gentlemen. Any questions? Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. <coughs> Any other comments? I just have a question. Um, the executive session that is John Mizuka. The executive session that's uh, at the end. Can you tell what the topic is? We're on the public hearing for the town plan. Oh, okay. When we move into the Thank select you. board meeting, Sorry. if you want to ask that question during Thank the you. public hearing. Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> Jesse Davis from Stagecoach, representing Stagecoach. Stagecoach. I'm not a Randolph resident, so I don't know if you need to have a move, movement for, to allow me to speak or not. I believe that's only at town meeting where okay. we have to authorize that, so you're all set. Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. Um, Stagecoach did submit uh, suggestions to Marty. I don't know if we're passed on to the select board or if they stayed with the planning commission um, concerning the, the pieces that obviously have to do with public transportation or could have impacts on public transportation. Everything from physical infrastructure to financial support to joining forces in um, encouraging people to ride public transit versus using their own vehicles. Um, the appendix about transportation obviously is show, showing its age. Things have progressed since then, so we submitted an entirely new appendix piece to Marty, um, essentially bringing it up to what the current status of stagecoach is. Um, as far as in revision to policies within the uh, transportation section, which is chapter three, um, integrating the land use and transportation planning, including collaboration with stagecoach, uh, to reduce energy and environmental impacts of transportation resulting from development, Things like the complete streets planning system where public transit and space for public transit is taken into consideration in a piece of the planning. Everything from areas where buses can pull in and safely be out of the roadway so that people can get on and get off, and also the bus itself is safe. As well as bus shelters and things of, of that nature, of an infrastructure nature. Um, and again, for, for the, for the um, construction projects as they come online or as they are con conceived, Again, utilizing those complete street standards so that there's space for people to use public transit because if they want it and they can't access it, then it's kind of a moot point. Um, also, as far as some action steps, um, again, working with Stagecoach to 
work especially with the larger employers to encourage them to both support Stagecoach financially but also to have their employees access Stagecoach to use public transit to get to work, whether it's LED, whether it's more casting, whoever. Those are possibilities as far as bus stops in the future. If those companies are want to have their employees getting there at a given time, and those employees are clustered in areas like Bethel, Randolph, Royalton, etc., there may be options that we could provide to those employers and employees, which would reduce the traffic congestion, which would reduce parking needs at those facilities, etc. Um, and I'll also continuing our relationship with the town. The town is already a considerable and generous uh, funder of Stagecoach, and we are very grateful for that. And we want to continue that uh, going forward. <coughs> in the fiscal year that just closed, which is for us fiscal 18, closed, that closed in June, the ridership just in Randolph alone jumped well over 50% versus fiscal year 17. That's a combination of our bus services and our volunteer drivers who are using their own vehicles to take people door to door for pretty much anything, whether it's medical needs, grocery shopping, social things, whatever the case might be. But Randolph residents alone, uh, their ridership increased well over 50% in the last fiscal year alone. Just as, just as an example, and that's due in part to the support that Randolph has provided financially and logistically. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay. <coughs> Any other questions or comments from the public? Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Go ahead. Correct angle beam. Let me stand up since I'm not that close. I just have a couple, um, <coughs> I think the right word, grammatical errors. I don't know that it really makes a lot of sense to sit here and explain the, uh, should have an S <coughs> at the end. It's literally that. Okay. Uh, Adolfo, are you okay with her just forwarding them to you? Yeah. Or to Marty? Basically spelling corrections. Yeah, share them with me and then I'll share them with the appropriate committee. talks about the fact that um, industrial wind power is being cited in Vermont. It, it, I think it's just a remnant from the last town plan um, type of language. And I just wanted to make the point that it really was not a relevant statement because industrial <coughs> wind largely is dead in Vermont. It, it's just not. Uh, we have a governor who has a policy um, and, the, and the Public Utility Commission is not actively permitting large industrial wind uh, turbine. So it was just um, an inaccurate reflection of the current state of the development that's occurring in the, in the state of Vermont. So my suggestion was just to eliminate that sentence because it is uh, just a little irrelevant uh, in terms of reflecting current status. Sorry, Brooke, what page are you on? Um, which sentence? Page, it's Appendix B, the energy section, which is like, 60 pages into the document. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, just one of those attachments to the town plan. No, I'm in there. I'm just, I, there's a lot of, there's one paragraph that says include wind, solar, hydroelectric, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to or something else. Let, let me grab it. Okay. Somebody Thanks. Me something and I got a little mixed up on which version I was looking at. All right. Thank you. Small and larger commercial scale 
wind turbines are being installed in Vermont. Um, I think if you just take that out, it's a little bit more reflective of reality. Or if you want to leave small commercial scale, I, I don't know of any wind projects other than just like individual, you know, personal turbines that kind of thing that's really actively being cited at this point. Great, well, thanks. I took note of the page, but would you also, when you submit through your suggested edits, could you also point that out? So, Absolutely. thank you. Just me. Are you all set, Brooke? Thank you. Okay. Jerry? Um, this is a process issue. Um, I don't think I'm alone in having difficulty finding the town plan until someone found it and showed it to me. It is on the website, but it took us a word search to find it. And I think before the next hearing, I hope that we can find a way to distribute it a little bit better in case anybody actually wants to read it. I don't think I'm alone in saying it was very tough to find it. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, it's not a good reason. Should be one for okay. kind of thing. Any other public Concern comments out. concerning so the town plan? On Jerry's comment, does that mean that there will be another hearing? You'll do a second? Yes. So like, okay. uh, on the town plan, it's noted that it'll be September right. 13th. Okay. Okay. Any comments or questions from the board? Yes, uh, I have a question. Um, would you, oh, I'm Joan Allen. Um, would you accept uh, comments by by letter? Because um, I have a bunch of things that are probably too long to go through here. Um, and I just read the plan once because I just was able to find it this afternoon on the website. Um, so I really don't have time to sort of put my comments in a coherent way, but I'd love to be able to submit something like we could do now in the next year. Is that a valid way to submit comments? Yeah, if you would submit them to Adolfo and Marty, okay. that would be, I think that would be an acceptable way to submit them. A lot of them have to do with uh, questions about what exactly we're planning to do in the flood zones, in the floodplains. There was, I wasn't sure if there was conflicting information or just not clear to me um, what the town's sort of vision was for moving ahead and doing things or allowing act certain kinds of activities in uh, the river corridor. Okay. Yeah, if you could submit that, there may be follow up uh, for clarification, but uh, please do that as soon as possible for that reason so that way we can bounce back and forth. Okay. Anyone else? All right. I'll uh, close the public hearing for the town plan and remind you that it is on September 13th. It'll be, uh, it's proposed to be at the beginning of the set board meeting that night. So similar to tonight's format, that's uh, when it'll happen next. All right. September 13th. That's it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, 13th. All right, I'll call to order the uh, monthly meeting of the select board. Um, at this time, we will take uh, public comments. The public comments are for, uh, for items that are not on the agenda. John Pimentel, East Randolph. Uh, I wanted to announce to the select board the formation of a, a group uh, in the East Valley um, called the East Valley Community Group. Betsy Race and Eric Pinion are also members of that group as well as others. The uh, East Valley Community Group seeks to promote neighbors, meeting neighbors, and celebrate life in our villages of North, East, and South Randolph. Our goals include completing the renovation of the historic East Valley Community Hall in East Randolph to serve as a regional resource and a collaborative, collaborative to meet the needs of the East Valley inhabitants. We're um, going to be working with the RACDC. Um, we've had several meetings with Adolfo to, to discuss our efforts going forward. And during the next uh, month and weeks, we'll be mapping out our strategies and timelines as, as we move into this project. We wanted to announce ourselves to the select board because you weren't aware of the formation of our group. And we're hoping that we can um, count on the support of the select board in our efforts to renovate the hall. And 
look forward to coming and um, reporting to the select board on our efforts as we move forward. Any questions for us? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Uh, since all three of you are standing, could you state your name? I'm Betsy Race. Betsy. Eric Kenyon. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a little bit of, there's actually two approaches to our committee. And uh, one is certainly reviving neighborhood and the East Valley, because the geography work a little separated, um, and the renovation of the hall. So there's kind of two approaches going on. So there's a lot of different people helping with different uh, uh, aspects of that. Um, the renovation of the hall were probably, I'm sure, different these fellas and maybe me, I don't know, will be in from time to time to give you updates, um, ask for money, <laughs> more money, <laughs> no, working on um, some fundraising, and like we say, with and grant money and things like that. But we do want to keep you uh, up to date on it. I know Adolfo is, and Adolfo is a busy man. And um, so we just want to kind of make sure you know that we're alive and well. And have started some meetings with Adolfo and um, Julie around grants and funding and getting a plan together for that. Just Johnson. Yeah, just to follow up with what Betsy said, knowing that the town and Adolfo and Betsy, I mean, excuse me, Julie at RECDC are busy folks. We're all volunteering our time to help. Uh, try to move this project forward and um, so we're just looking forward to you know getting more involved in the community and working on the hall and coming to you folks from time to time to just to bring you up to speed on where we are do you know where we're at not exactly <laughs> well you okayed some grant money here yeah. a couple weekends ago for a structural engineer matching grant and when we get that information, we'll have a lot more information about, of course, what it's going to cost. Right. <laughs> One of the things that we have a magic wand wish is that the structural engineer will think that it's okay to use the upstairs of the hall. The fire marshal, we've been in contact with the fire marshal. He's had been at meetings with us and looking at what needs to be up to code for upstairs. The downstairs has to have the bathrooms ADA compliant. There's just a lot more going on downstairs, so we might be able to start renting them. Great. Right. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions or comments from the board? I, I totally support what they're doing over there. I've, I've been in contact with Betsy back back in March and. So she's making, they're making a lot of effort over there. I've been following their email chain, and so they've got uh, working with Paul Bruner <coughs> Preservation Trust to uh, work on some grant stuff. So I think their the email list keeps getting bigger. So I think it looks to me like you guys are making a lot of headway within the community. So. Thank you. Okay. Any other pu uh, public comments to be heard at this time? Do you have any questions? Uh, I guess we don't have any questions. Okay. Or you looking for more questions for you from the public? No, I'm just wondering. Yeah, Zach? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm sorry? Your name? Oh, uh, yeah, Zach Fre Freeman. Um, I'm with the Rochester Randolph Area Sports Trails Alliance, the uh, local um, outdoor recreation club here in the uh, Seventh Vermont area. And, and the town of Randolph and the surrounding towns as well. Um, I'm here to just speak on behalf of the outdoor recreation component that's in, in the town plan. Um, for consideration, uh, there could be a stronger component in there as we move for, forward. Uh, there's a lot of examples of other communities that have written a very robust and well-rounded outdoor recreation plan. Um, as you guys all well know, there's quite a bit of the energy right now uh, growing in the outdoor recreation uh, world here in town, and that does encompass the, the broad range of outdoor recreation sports. And with <clears throat> a little bit more verbiage in there, um, the town could um, 
do itself good with with uh, with move, with moving forward. One of the main things uh, that's coming down the pipeline is Phil Scott announced Borek, and uh, one of the first programs of that, a town here in Vermont, is going to be named the uh, Outdoor Friendly Recreation Town Pilot Program. And so I think if we had a little bit of a stronger um, a stronger presence with outdoor recreation when it's time to apply for that. I think that Randolph has got a very good chance of winning that. Um, I can share with you guys all of the details on that afterwards. Um, I'm fine also with sharing um, another email um, that would have uh, uh, Gunnison, Gunnison, Colorado's uh, Parks and Recreation plan that they wrote for their town. Grant, granted, the town's two and a half or three times as big as Randolph, but there's key components of that plan that really stand out, and it's very well worded and helps all of the local clubs and the community um, move, move for, forward. Um, so I would just, um, in closing, just if there's any consider consideration of a more robust outdoor recreation component to to the town plan. I would be glad to follow up with um, an email and some highlights that could be added. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Comments from the board. I would just suggest maybe Zach forward that stuff to Delfo so that you can take a look at it. Would that be okay? Yeah. Sure. All right. Couple all right. Any other uh, comments to be heard that are not associated with the agenda? Okay. We'll move out of public comment and welcome the chair, so I can turn it over to her. <laughs> <laughs> We're at the approval of agenda, and had a question about an agenda item later from Mr. Mazuka, so we. Tabled that until we got to that part of the agenda. Until we got so, to that item? Yeah. So we're on to consent calendar? Uh, no. The approval of the agenda. I do have one item that I was hoping to ask the board to consider adding under other business. It was a um, bid package that was submitted to the town for uh, replacement of the septic tanks in the Randolph Center garage. Uh, town staff were just not able to pull the material together in time for the actual notice um, to be put on the agenda. So if the board feels comfortable adding it to other business, uh, we could certainly add it and discuss it. And if it doesn't feel comfortable voting on a contract that was not duly warned on the agenda, we can push it back to the next select board meeting, but at the very least commence the conversation during this meeting. Any concern about that? No. No. Good. Any other changes to the agenda? Uh, there was a question from the public on the agenda. I just have a question. Are you able to tell us what the topic of the executive session is? Yes, it is a confidential communication between the town attorney and the governing body. Second. Motion in the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Next, we have the consent calendar, which has the meeting minutes of the 12th, uh, warrants, and cemetery plot sales. Motion to approve the consent calendar. And then a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstained? Motion carries. New business. The dog complaint. Maybe the owner of the dog room? We have our um, 
Animal Control Officer in the audience today. And, uh, Milo, would you give an update of well, how the issue started and where we are? Um, there's an incident up on East Bethel Road um, of owners who had a German Shepherd who was apparently off property on the neighbor's property, um, ended up getting into a dog fight, again, without the witnesses here. Um, I have bits and pieces of details. Um, the other, I guess, people lab mix. Um, and another dog that was visiting or hangs out up there um, ended up severely injuring <clears throat> the dog, dragging it out into the road, um, and the owners of the dog had to have it put down. So the question, again, without having the actual witnesses and individuals involved, it's difficult to determine the details of, is this a vicious dog case, is this you know, the, the dog that ended up um, with the deceased was off the shop property. Um, my understanding from the owner of the Pitbull Lab Mix, um, I was expecting him to be here, was that he feeds his dog on his porch and uh, the offending dog, the, or the offending dog, the, the dog that was, that ended up being put down was over on uh, Jason's old property, rooting through garbage, and then the shoot away went over to the other trailer uh, where the Pitbull Lab lives and is fed on the porch. And apparently that's where the attack initially took place. And another witness said they then saw them dragging uh, the German Shepherd down the road. And so, so again, still trying to weigh details without the owners here um, and witnesses. It's hard to know. The, the the town staff obtained the report on Friday and uh, began to work in accordance with the, the dog ordinance policy with the town to share with the appropriate staff members, conduct the investigation, bring this to the attention of the board. Uh, hold this type of communication with the community and the board to investigate. Um, we have had both Milo and also uh, Marty, town <coughs> engineer and zoning administrator, uh, speak to a number of different people, including the dog owners involved, uh, also speaking to, to various witnesses, ensuring that the appropriate people were communicated with in terms of both telephone calls. Milo, you spoke with people over the telephone and informed yeah, them. That I spoke with the owners of the dog that's deceased and was hung up on. Um, they've had a history of complaints against about their dogs when he was barking a lot. And um, the owner stated he let his dog out, didn't pay attention, he went off property. Um, when I tried to explain to him the dog ordinance and having a select board hearing over the situation, if it's a vicious dog incident, he hung up on me, I called him back, and he basically said, yeah, I'll just deal with it myself, and if the dog comes on my property, I'll shoot it. Um, I've had other conversations with these owners that have just screamed out with profanities. Um, so that's the amount of communication I've been able to have with them. Um, I spoke with um, Steve Churchill, who's the owner of the Pitbull Lab. Um, I guess he's a rescue dog. He said he's, you know, gotten him trained. I have an email from Marty's met the dog, said it's you know, a friendly dog. Um, obviously, dogs behave differently when they're defending their property and when there's other dogs involved and they get into pet brutality. Um, as far as the ordinance goes, I mean, it, it's a horrible situation, obviously, all around. Um, Mr. Churchill was supposed to get his dog registered today. Um, when I spoke with him this morning, um, he didn't get the rabies shot updated because it was a rescue and he didn't have the paperwork. Um, he was, I was expecting him to be here to speak more on the situation over there. Um, my understanding is that 
um, the, the Ford's dog has been running loose and on their property a lot. Um, so, again, it's, it's about, you know, this, this is all piecemeal that I've gotten to the various people. Um, Mr. Churchill was not home, he came home immediately when he was called and he tried to so, and, uh, as what Milo is, is, is sharing with the board, um, we've had various conversations in varying detail with all the parties involved. We tried to bring them here to share their point of view and their perspective with the board. Um, just given the nature of the incident, um, we are not entirely certain if the incident occurred, started on private property and then moved onto public property, uh, which would make this not a direct violation of the ordinance or if it started on public property and all dogs were on the road itself at that point it is more of a direct violation of the dog ordinance um, but without the witnesses being here it's it would be a challenge to determine best course of action other than when the dogs were not licensed and there was no proof of their vaccinations which is something that we're working on now but the the dogs that are still alive are problems. Mm -hmm. They run, for, they run around and get complaints about them. No, not those. I've never had complaints about those dogs. It was okay. the dog that's deceased. Um, those owners I've had for a long time, numerous complaints about. They would tie their dogs out, and the dogs would bark for hours and hours and hours, and they started letting their dogs out. Um, just a few weeks ago, we went down there. Um, Tabers called us because they're other dog there, um, St. Bernard, was running loose. They had just let it out and then left um, their property, and it was running all over the properties on this Bethel Road. Um, so, but I've never had, I didn't even know um, Steve Churchill was living on the Saul's property or that he had a dog. Um, and then the, the other dog, the smaller dog, that I guess ended up participating in the attack um, belongs to Santina. I believe it's young. And I spoke with her. Uh, the response, I guess she hangs out there a lot but doesn't live there. Uh, the response I got from her regarding registering your dog is I don't have the money. And I explained to her, well, my suggestion would be find the money and get your dog registered because by state and order ordinance, um, unregistered dogs can be confiscated and destroyed, so get your dog At the risk of sounding too callous, hasn't the problem solved itself? <laughs> mm. Basically? Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. Hopefully the same for now. <laughs> yeah, I have to keep the other one home. But we can't order anything on that one. Right. Or was that one, that one wasn't involved, right? That one wasn't involved as far as I So you just encourage them to get that dog registered, and I think there's not much that we can actually do about it at this point. That we're not going to see anybody here to talk with us about it. So I don't think there's any action to take, do you? I think it's resolved. I think so. <laughs> Sounds to me like it is. So just for a matter of documentation, is there a written warning <coughs> that goes out to the owners of the unregistered dogs? Is, I mean, is that a physical record or is that just a verbal conversation? Um, I've just given them a verbal warning. Okay. Um, and then I'll follow up to make sure that they do register their dogs. Um, and then at that point, um, I, I'm pretty confident from my conversation with Mr. Churchill that he's going to get a dog registered. He just needs to get a rabies shot because he doesn't have a certificate um, from the previous owners from me. Santina. I don't know if she's going to go get the dog registered or not. Um, and from there, we can either choose to. Um, oh. Santina now. Yes, we're talking about the dogs. <clears throat> so I'm not too late. No. 
it's on the agenda. Do we need more details on this? Hmm? Do we need more details? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty much. So. Well, they didn't have the time. Were you able to get your dog registered? No. I don't really want to get to. I'm not going to take action, right? No. no. Not against no. the They're on their own property. The only thing is to recommend they get registered. Recommend they get a dog registered. Right? Does sound like inside? I think we're done with the topic. Which is on I think the at this point, the only yeah. thing to do is register the dogs. Yes, ma'am. I just registered mine, so. I have to get them. Okay. I have one coon dog that needs a vet visit for a ribby shop before. Okay. Sounds, to me, like, <laughs> sounds, sounds to me sounds to me like that's what needs to happen. Then. Yeah. I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Great. It's on the agenda. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Right or wrong? Hey, whispering. I'm not in church. <laughs> We're in a meeting now. So. Next on the agenda is the general briefing from the director of recreation. Stepped out. Seems to have stepped out. Yeah. Come back to that. Okay. Sure. The ready presentation. I guess that would be me. That would be you. So again, for the record, Paul Haskell from Vermont Futures and resident up on Fish Hill Road. Um, I, I don't know that I have a lot to add other than the progress that's been made. Um, not necessarily in order of, of uh, timing or, or importance, but I met with Perry Armstrong uh, earlier this week uh, along with my colleague C.J. Stump and went over the details. I don't know that we added anything to the conversation um, other than kind of close the loop on the, on the, the, the various loose ends. The, the application that uh, is one way that you initiate a red, the formation of a ready district from at least 20 s uh, voters in the uh, affected area was, I, I didn't know where, to, where it ultimately needed to land, so I gave it to Adolfo. That seemed like mm -hmm. the best. I did, uh, I did uh, and Joyce wasn't in, but I did talk to the clerk's office and we all agreed that was, let's let the, because there's not a well, in fact, I don't know that this is only the second ready that has been formed in Vermont. So there's, so my there's, understanding of the Yeah, right yeah. So the, but I believe the process is somebody should at some point verify that there are 20 voters. And there's a, there's, I'm, I'm reasoning there's certain we have 20 voters on that list or more. Um, the other way that that can happen, by the way, is that the select board can simply, on their own motion, initiate the process. So that's that's where we are with that. Um, in turn, I've, I've also provided uh, to Adolfo um, a draft copy of uh, the proposed bylaws for the district. Um, these are pretty much boil, boilerplate for the most part. Um, the one, you know, other than defining the geography, they are they are almost the exact replica of the bylaws that were drafted and enacted in the Newberry Ready. Um, they describe the governance. It's a little bit simplified here in. Um, in Randolph because we're all staying within one town boundary. In the end, the select board will appoint five members to that governing board. Um, the governing board itself can then add another four members who need not be members of the district, so that allows expertise that might be needed. Um, and then beyond that, the business plan of the the, the summary of the business plan for the proposed district is, uh, and our planned next steps as we move forward are to pre-subscribe, literally do the door. Now, how many people here know what full, what the Fuller Brush Man was? <laughs> yeah. 
there are some people who either are very great students of history, I'm sure that's the case in the chair, or some of us yeah. who they came uh, when we were kids. Who have been around long <laughs> enough uh, to remember when I got somebody would come around door to door selling brushes. Cleaning supplies. Yep. Yeah, and eventually they yes. And um, you can buy them online still. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, you can't. Yeah. Well, so, couldn't back then for sure. Yeah, as long as you have internet, which <laughs> right. was exactly some of, us, some of us struggle with. Um, but we will do essentially canvas the neighborhood door to door. Our goal will be to uh, pre-subscribe to have enough pre-subscription so that we are have some reasonable assurance that we have. 150% of what our anticipated debt service would be on building the network. Um, uh, the important, and 150% or greater, of course, the importance of that is the more margin that you have in terms of the, the perceived revenues, the lower the interest rate would be. And so uh, uh, we, have, we have had conversations with local financing with the, the local banks. We will also be talking to um, VITA, the Vermont Economic Development Authority. They have specific language um, that enables them to, to finance projects like this. And, and the ceiling is, is, I think, several million dollars, so it's well above what we would need uh, in order to qualify. Final steps are build the network. The, 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 the ready governing board will continue in perpetuity to own that asset and manage it, or not manage it, own it, and provide governance to it, policy governance. It will be operated by a, a private entity. Uh, and almost certainly that would be consolidated communications. Since the quid pro quo for, the quid pro quo in this is overlashing the fiber onto the existing copper. And that, that brings roughly 25% of the cost of building a mile of fiber, just mm -hmm. by removing the step called make ready. And it, and it com almost completely eliminates any of the delays that are often associated with that, where you have locations on poles that have to be moved up and down. And sometimes that involves two or possibly three other parties who were involved in that. And so eliminating that step eliminates a lot of money and a lot of delay. And the construction, with any luck, will proceed um, before the snow flies. Uh, a, a reminder that the Fish Hill stock farm loop that we're talking about and the tributaries there too, this is, a, and I told, the, Poor Perry really wants to know that this is not the last thing we intend to do in Randolph, and it's really just the proof of concept pilot project um, in, in, in doing this particular project and type of project here. As you can envision, the, the Stock Farm Fish Hill community really presents an awful lot of variation. There's, Great sections of that road that are pretty darn vacant. Farms and quite great distances that have to be traversed. And then there are other areas of it that are obviously fairly uh, uh, thickly populated. And so it presents good proof of concept in terms of the financials. Um, the real key to this thing is the community organizing effort. Um, the, the going, the, the fuller brush, the going door to door, uh, whether it's virtually or, or in person, um, and by doing some of the other things that we intend to is, is an excellent, you know, proving that model and bringing the subscription rate up uh, to the levels that we're talking about. So going to the concept, the, the town has to approve the creation of this. And then mm -hmm. the town appoints board members of this. How is this different than, say, the Burlington Electric model or the Burlington Telecom model? Uh, well, um, the couple of other models, Burlington is a telecom, originally was designed as a telecom 
department of town government. So that's how that one started. It has now been spun off to a private entity, another company. Mm -hmm. But it was separate for a while in there when it, it created all that debt. And it was not separate. It was a department. It was still a department. It was within. a department. I mean, that was, I, I don't want to relive any more of the history well, that either. we that's do after, asking. but the, it, one of the big issues was the, the, the city actually, whether it was inadvertent or not, ended up financing a lot of that debt because they were paying bills that there wasn't. So if the town creates this and the town appoints members to the board, how can the town not have any liability? The town's liability is very specifically, um, as far as financial liability, that's handled statutorily in, in, in at least a dozen, well, maybe I'm exaggerating, in at least four or five places in Vermont statute, um, the, the towns engaging in telecom may not access the grand list, or the towns finances, which are a product of the grant list. And more specifically, the, 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 the financial uh, future, or the financial, um, a, a tele, any telecom district that's formed can only cover its debt service from the revenues of the project. And that's On the subscription base. Yeah, in, in other words, you, so if it, if it goes bust, it goes bust. And the, for the, not that I predict that, but were that to happen, there would be no recourse to the town or to the residents. The owners of the, of the debt would be, their only recourse would be to um, the assets that the, 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 the particular project has. Which are the which is the fiber on the pole? Fiber on the pole, right? And and the and the connection, the other asset would be the subscribers. So the the closer analog, which I I meant to go to is EC fiber, mm -hmm. and EC fiber is is constituted under a, a separate also recent addition to Vermont law, which enables a telecom district municipal telecom district to be formed. That, that's more closely modeled on, say, solid waste districts. Uh, in that case, the same language prevails that says none of the financial um, shortcomings of, of the organization will fall back on taxpayers. So it's a similar it's a similar model. In that case, it's the 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 one thing that that type of model does create is the ability. It's 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 only designed to take entire chunks of entire towns as its. Um, and by the way, there's a there's a there's another telecom union district that's attempting to be formed up in the Montpelier. Middlesex, several, like, there were like a half a dozen or more towns that voted at their town meeting to join those. Um, the difference between a telecom union district and a, and, a, and a ready district is that the ready district is, you know, has a much more streamlined formation process. After that, all of the all of the, the, the processes by which, you know, in the, for example, in the case of, of EC Fiber, um, as you well know, you appoint somebody to be the town's delegate and alternates to the, to the governing board. Mm -hmm. So if, if electricity could come back to the town through, should there be a failing of that project, it would, be, it would be the same thing that we're talking about here. And there is a firewall very clearly between that organization and 
unless the town in some way acted in, you know, with, with negligence and, mm. and malice aforethought, the town would otherwise be in the same way that you're, you're precluded from having responsibility for some of waste district failings or any of those kind of things. So can I tell, uh, here's, so here's my little part of the story. So what I like about this concept is that this can happen faster than what EC Fiber can apparently do for us in this region. And the reason for that is, is after I attended a hearing down in Windsor three weeks ago. Um, governor's staff was touring Windsor and um, I was invited to come down and listen and testify on this situation about the importance of broadband access to the rural locations. And so in listening to that conversation, exactly what Paul's saying is, is that in order for you to get space on the poll, there's a quite lengthy process, and the lady who manages that process told us it's six months to get permission to be on the polls here. It's a long, drawn-out application process. It costs them a lot of money. This project, if, it can, if this can work with Consolidated, and they be, Consolidated becomes the managers of that fiber that's attached to the copper, then it seems to me that that's a no-brainer right off the bat because they're the ones that control that space or they're part of that space anyways. So this is going to happen in their space. So... <coughs> From this conversation and listening to people testifying about it, the economic impact of this is there's actually realtors that were saying, look, you know, we, we're taking people out to look at all these really beautiful houses and these properties out at the end of these back roads that are for sale, but they, and they want to buy them, but as soon as the kids pop out of the car and there's no connection, you know, they're not looking at that property. They're moving on to find something else. So this is a big problem around the entire state is how to get more broadband access to the rural areas. So this model, I think, was created to help move this process along a little faster. So I don't foresee us giving up our position with EC Fiber, but I think that you know to create one of these readies, especially in this particular region over here, seems like a good experiment to see just how you know this could work and maybe this is a faster, quicker solution to get us to a better economic situation with those areas. So in that area, Paul, I'm, mm -hmm. how, how far does Comcast, if that's considered high speed, how far do they go out? I mean, and what percentage is not covered in that area that you're talking about? So we've, yeah, we've looked at that um, in two ways. One is, the first one is, um, they come up Fish Hill about the first mile or so. Okay. Um, they come up uh, Stock Farm um, just about to a little bit past uh, Clover Hill Road. So it's about a mile on that road. Um, we, we, we're not counting in our, at least preliminary assessment, we're not counting on those sections adding very many customers. Though, several of the people who signed the petition who live in areas that are served by them said, we will sign up for this service in a heartbeat. Yeah, it's probably cheaper. Well, there's a lot of dis there's a lot of discontent with Compast, and, and, and I'll show you my own personal experience, so you all know where I live. So I'm only like 500 feet off the highway. Comcast is at the pole, okay, below my house, 300 feet away. They will not connect me, okay. So right now I'm relying upon a DSL connection coming out of BTC, which isn't very fast. So in order for me to actually get access and get data that I need in my office down here, I'm calling my employee in Stratford, asking her to log in her computer because she's on EC Fiber so that I can check my inventory at 7 o'clock at night. And so this is a huge problem and Comcast is not interested. I offered to pay for the connection. You know, I said, I'll, I'll dig the trench, I'll put the pipe in, you know, I'll run the wire for you. And they will not touch it. They're very um, standoffish about expanding their network anywhere as there's not enough traffic. So that, I believe, is why we're in this jam we're in. And EC Fiber has no intentions of going down 66 because the Comcast is covering it. So if this is such a good idea, why doesn't Consolidated Services do it on their own? Capital. They, I mean, they are partners in this. I will tell you that about 12 months ago, uh, there was a dinner at our house on Fish Hill Road when the fellow who was nominally the president of Fairpoint, Vermont, 
at the time. He brought two really good Vermont bottles of wine, too. <laughs> really good stuff. Um, where we were the conversation, I mean, we had been in conversation with him for quite a while, and now it was sort of we want to actually get down to, to, to brass tacks on this. They're, they're saying, look, we, we internally, we're not the least bit enthused about the kind of infrastructure that we're currently able to provide for most of our world customers. Um, but we are, we are you know, if we can get access to fiber on the pole without adding a liability on our balance sheet, and we get to add the customers, the contract for the customers on the top end of the balance sheet, we're, we're all in. But we don't have, we, they, Fairpoint now consolidated, just doesn't have the wherewithal to do. Their current model is to, is to move to get more of the, what are called D-slams, digital subscriber line, access something or other, modules, um, closer so that there might be one a little bit closer to Perry than VTC. And that would change his, his mm, the, change the speed, speed characteristics uh, a little bit. But they would much prefer to be, and their, and their network is fed with fiber. It just is fiber. It's the last mile part of it that they don't do. And it's, it's purely functional capital. So along the lines of the core customer report for Comcast, there isn't a great track record for consolidated either. Why wouldn't we bid this out? If you're because, looking to put it on, uh, and if time wasn't a concern, why wouldn't we bid money, it out? Money's the concern. Again, taking that six to $7,000 a mile out of the project changes. So the, the model we're looking at, for example, just to turn this around the other way, the model we're looking at is um, compared to EC Fiber's roughly $99 a month service, we're talking about $49 a month because we're bringing the cost out of that. That big piece of cost adds an awful lot to the financing model, and it's pure dead weight. And the question about Fairpoint service, Fairpoint's difficulty <laughs> of providing quality service is a function of not having the technology. Most of their complaints, at least as far as their, their broadband side, are complaints from people like Perry, who live, who have DSL but live far enough away from the access point, with enough traffic going on between them and that access point, that the service suffers, it falters. The technology is just there; it's just too weak to do what's done. So they 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 would also tell you. You put fiber up and you've eliminated 99% of the reasons that people call for service and complain about the service. And this appears to be the same one thing about around the entire state. It's about the speed. And as the technology seems to increase, I mean, this is what I heard in Windsor. It's just like you've got to get to this level of having the speed and this last mile of fiber. The last mile connection is the, that's the weakest link in the whole system is getting to this last mile thing. So with the fiber options, it seems like that's, you know, that's that is pretty much why this whole ready situation came to came to light was to be able to provide these these newer districts in my understanding was to be able to set up and be able to secure the financing and then using a company like Consolidated takes care of all the maintenance aspects of this. So they're actually servicing the same area, servicing the same territory, but now they're getting paid to do something. In my understanding, they're getting paid to take care of what's already on the pole, so they're already there doing it. So they're able to probably maximize, you know, their efficiencies by doing, adding this to the system. And it certainly speeds the process up because I was floored when I heard it's like, you know, six months to get access to a pole. And this is what EC fiber struggles are. And, you know, there's just, they've got one or two people down there. Just strictly that's all they're doing is 
working on permitting and applications to get on these poles. And so here's consolidated already sitting there. They, they have that already. So it's you're tagging their, I mean, it's a no-brainer to my mind, is you're, you're already tagging their resource. So it seems like it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> seems pretty easy. I don't know. I mean, the finance part of this, you know, seems seems feasible. So, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a fan of trying out a space <coughs> and see what happens. It could be a model for other places in the state. Well, why isn't it a model for the rest of the Randolph that it could has be. the same issue? It could be. By I this mean, we could, size in this area. We could. Well, I mean, I think this is a great place to start. You know, if you that's want to where expand we're it, at. That's, yeah. if you want to expand it, I mean, there's nothing that stops us from going and expanding it. Right. This one, once once this is formed, you know, it's a simple trip down here to say if we want to enlarge the footprint to include Hebert Hill, or for that matter, to go clear to the other side of town and pick up a piece of territory. There's nothing that that mandates that that when a ready is formed, its geography be contiguous. So we can go from Stock Farm, Fish Hill, and then we can go to East Randolph. We could go to you name it. Can so, hit, you can so hit the pockets that are currently not being hit by. We're going to have a hard time not having Perry be all oh, over us. Yeah, it's going to be his on. house next. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of other people. By the way, I wanted. Something I, I, I meant to touch on when we were asking the question, what, what's it, sort of what's in it for Fairpoint or consolidated? And one of the things is they're, they're keenly excited about the notion that they, are, they would be able to move out of a regulated environment, which their copper telephone lines are, to a non-regulated. Now the fix for us is the ready will continue to own and govern its asset. And in the contract with Fairpoint will be language that is that provides a quasi-regulatory, <coughs> we, we want to have input on pricing, we want to know that, for example, uh, families on free and reduced lunch would be able to have a subsidy for their service if that were available. Those kinds of things would be part of the the, the governance <coughs> that the ready would provide. So it would serve a quasi-regulatory and also to serve as an advocate for improving the technology. If if the, the networks there is capable of, uh, say, 100 megabits, and there's now clamoring in enough of a, of a market for a gigabit network, that would be conversation that would go back to consolidated that we now want to, in our contract, we want to put that on a, on a fast track, for example. So, oh. Has the uh, town lawyer looked at any of this? Not yet, no. I don't know who, who is your lawyer work with a number of different attorneys, but the one for this particular case would probably be Paul Gillies. Okay, um, Barlow, I think is, is with Paul Gillies. I'm, I'm, it's a long time since I followed up with him. He was the attorney for Newberry, who looked at essentially this exact same package. Um, and our sort of legal Council for Vermont Futures on this project is Paul Giuliani. And you probably know there is hardly a piece of infrastructure in the state of Vermont with public dollars in it that hasn't washed through his office from one time to another. And so, you know, we, we worked with him closely on the drafting of the legislation that became the Reddies. We worked with him on, so it, it, it certainly has had more legal over the shoulder than me looking at it, which would be dangerous. So, so Paul, I just have one more question. Sure. For folks, when they sign up for this service, once it's established and all that, is there a minimum commitment time? Do they have to sign up for a year or two years? Are they obligated? How does that, <coughs> and, and my question goes to this, really, because, you know, I've traveled kind of around the world a bunch, and I kind of see that wired, Technology is becoming less and less, and so cellular tower, cellular technology is increasing. So one of the concerns is as we add towers to town, which I think we recently did, and folks get more access to that, are you going to lose your subscription base because people are already paying for their cell phone and their unlimited data plans and all that stuff? 
I, I mean, really good question and something that we've thought a lot about. Okay, good. Yeah, well, and, <laughs> but to answer the, just, more than that, at least at this point, we have not thought about it as a minimum requirement. What we have thought about is um, for those people who come on board now, the connection costs are all borne under the, the, that agreement. Coming onto the network later, you know, if you're a homeowner and you say, ah, you know, I don't know if I want to sign up, I'll wait and see. You know, that's we're going to try to dissuade people from that. So this, so the coming in at a later date is going to be a lot higher. Okay. Um, so is the plan the, on the investment side when they sign up initially? That's going to cover a lot of the costs. I mean, what percentage does that? Well, there, the, people are only going to be. There may be an investment opportunity. We haven't quite got okay. to that point yet. But um, I guess I read between the lines. If you sign up early, meant some sort of investment in the. No, the, the, okay. you know, there's some thought about there being an equity stake somewhere in the model for people who become customers. And we haven't really thought that one all the way through, but I mean, at least on one fork of the model, if you run the numbers out, at some point this asset, if it doesn't succumb to the, too much to the trend you're talking about, becomes an incredibly valuable. Because the one thing about, you know, Fiber's got a, a book value of 50 years. It's probably got a, truthfully got a useful life of at least 100 years. It's mm -hmm. almost, the stuff that, the quality of stuff that's available now is almost infinitely expandable. You can put a gigabit on it and then you can put a terabit on it and, and bandwidth, but that's one for it. And where we share that revenue at some point is subject for, and then the other thought is, at least the other thought is, for the foreseeable 20 years that we'll be, have debt service payments to worry about. The combination of the, the use case, which is there, there will probably not in our, in the next 20 years be wireless technology that lets you do high definition videos, you know, get your entertainment and do your home-based business and your kids do. That's still going to probably be, I mean, until we decide to level Vermont, get rid of all these damn hills and mountains, <laughs> wireless just has some inherent Challenger. Trouble. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. So I just have one more question. So what uh -huh. conflicts do you see, what conflicts are there that would prevent you to go to certain areas? Because obviously if you could go from here to the end of the street, you could pick up 20 customers with 500 feet of wire instead of picking up 20 customers with four miles of wire. Mm -hmm. So what are the conflicts you see to you basically doing your whole town and what would, and why? Um, I, I, I think the, well, the notion would be if you can, if you can find a customer base that supports the debt service requirement, we'd go anywhere. And that could be right through town. What we would, what our motivation <coughs> is as the nonprofit sort of advocate for this is we really do want to push it out into areas of town that have nothing. That's because part of it is we see it as, a, as that combination of priming the economic engine, priming the education engine, converting some forms of health care to, to remote health care. Um, there are lots of things that are that are part of that and and building the community is the ultimate. I mean, behind all of this, we're still trying to figure out how our organization, when it gets paid for this, how it can actually get paid for what it really wants to do, which is get paid for the increased prosperity of the, and 
connectivity. Connectivity in the sense of human connectivity, social connectivity, civic participation, and those kind of things, which are really what we're, we're not really all that interested, or at least I'm not all that interested in, in the technology. I'm not all that interested in running a fiber company. I'm more interested in knowing that you can work from home, that your kids can, can learn the Japanese language from somebody in Japan, um, and that Perry doesn't have to call the poor lady in Stratford you know, every night to find out what the hell's going on. Which is kind of true. And that wouldn't have happened if they hadn't gotten AC Fiber over there. But when they got that, she's actually, her speed and her connectivity, she can log on and she's looking at her screen like she's looking at in her office. I can't do that. Yeah. So. And one of the things that we like about that is, um, I'm sure it's somewhat true of Randolph. When I was in Sharon before I came here, we knew that the, that the level of the town raised about two inches after 8 a.m. because of the large number of people that were leaving town to go work in <laughs> West Lab and Hanover to the point where our volunteer fire department had one member who was actually physically to be found inside the town boundary on any given day and our fire chief was driving from Dartmouth College to a fire in Sharon which he claimed he could do in 20 minutes. I'm a bit dubious about that. But it also changes the entire social structure of the town when you know parents can be home to meet their kids when they come home from school. You can, you know, da 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 da. Yeah, I think it's a great and, idea. And communities, neighborhoods have people that are there, which makes them safer. You know, again, all of the metrics point to doing that. There isn't any reason, like, why we wouldn't go anywhere else. And often it makes an awful lot of sense to go through some of the more populated and even already served areas because just that's the way the connect connectivity and the network design would naturally take you. And if we can offer people a superior service at a lower price, and in the end make the entire network work, then that's, that would be, and so could it be the whole town? I, I don't see why not. Would it, would it grow to that eventually? Perhaps. Yeah, the part of that that isn't that could happen also is it's a little more complicated, but you could actually involve the communities of Braintree and Brookfield into this. But you have to have their town select boards be part of the equation. But it could broaden, it could expand the whole situation because it can cross town lines. And, and we're actually hoping that by the time we get to that decision, we may have another legislative remedy that. Makes that easier. Just to grow a lot more organically and quickly, and and frankly, you know, at this point, as I've said, there's not much connection between these things and the, and the town, the underlying town, except the original approval by the select board, and then the annual feeding of the governing board when you make five appointments, and so. The logic of the underlying towns being part of it might be able to be made easier and streamlined and so forth. But that's a, that's for down the road. Okay. Any more questions? Thanks. Comments? Um, questions from the audience? The one question that I have, because this, <coughs> this is a little bit sort of, we're all kind of making this up as we go along. But at some point, we need to figure out how you guys pull the pin. Mm -hmm. What what is it that's going to at the next meeting be the? I, I know we want to have the bylaws looked at. We want to have right. the town attorney kind of have some oversight, and I will make myself, you know, completely available to help Adolfo and meet with the attorneys and anything else just to answer questions. Um, we have. We will. Ha I presume we will at some point have determined that we have a valid 20 signature application, and then at some point that all has to come in 
where somebody here makes a motion and, and the five of you vote. And I'm not sure I know exactly. Only if it gets seconded. They, they, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that's the step. That see, those are the, see, that's the, the challenge just, right there you know, to get a second in. <laughs> see, yeah, we're not really, we, we, all the details haven't been thought through. But right. No, that would be. We're helping. Yeah. So, I, again, I, I, I will work with Adolfo. Yeah. I think that's where I'm at with this. Okay, I want to know. Okay, from the legal standpoint, where we're, where are we on the hook? Where are we not on the hook? And then from that point on, I think that answers a lot of questions to move it forward. Well, also the difference in how this is set up is it, the town truly doesn't have to claim anything. It isn't uh, doesn't have to go on our financials. Doesn't have to go. It's like nowhere. No. That's what I want to make sure. Like yep. we're yep. totally. Two separate entities. Two separate Even entities. Even though we totally vote to clean. develop it, we appoint the majority of the board members. And it just feels like we've got so much control over this entity that there's a liability there somewhere. Well, that's what you would think. So, it's hard I to mean, believe it's that something you create it and you appoint the majority of the board. And yeah. You want your attorney to look at it. And <laughs> case law, of course, is what determines all this. And, and there so, isn't any. So, well, there's case law at least as far as the question of fire districts, which is what this is modeled on, the same kind of language. And so that, where in fact there sometimes is even appropriation of town funds to fire districts, so the relationship would even be closer. And, and I think everybody, you know, the, the, the statutory language and the case law support that the, the difficulty at this point is you, there's no way to create another municipal structure. The only two ways that it really can happen is a, a municipality sort of <clears throat> approves, authorizes, births a, a municipality, a sub-municipality, or the legislature charters one. And that's actually kind of where we're going with our other thought. But, um, for now, you, you you just can't go out and, and say, here's here's four points, this is our district, and we're going to form a municipality and put a sign up at the end of the road. It just, so you need you need a mechanism to do that in the boards. But again, attorneys there. Clear that up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. We heard from the town's director of recreation. She had a soccer assessment that needed to be performed tonight and had to leave. So she asked if we could maybe push the rec director's briefing to the next meeting. Sure. Done. Assembly permit for the New World Festival. Excuse me, I'm very sorry to interrupt. And it's possible that I'm that a mistake was, was made. Um, I, some weeks ago, was under the impression that um, the East Valley Community Group was to come at 6.30 and... and um, they were here at 5.30. And it was that it happened at 5.30. Yep. So something changed. Okay. Mm -hmm. but thank you very much. Yep. They gave a great chat, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Board knows about the group and their work. So, yeah. Good, good. Sure. Thank you. Sure. You're up. Thank you. Uh, so, Tom Harris from the Chenoweth Center for the Arts, the uh, organization that oversees the New World Festival. We filed our um, permit request for the New World Festival, uh, and it is essentially the same permit uh, and uh, footprint for the event that has been uh, in existence for a number of years now. So we're requesting granting of that permit for uh, the purpose of having the 26th annual New World Festival on the uh, Sunday of Labor Day weekend, as has been going on all those decades, all those years. And happy to answer any questions or we may have as I'm able. The town uh, has been working with Tom. We also uh, have shared the um, assembly permit with the Orange County Sheriff's Department, with the Randolph Village Fire Department. 
with uh, the health officer, highway department. We are awaiting signatures um, from all except for the Randolph Village Fire Department who has already approved. Uh, the only condition was that uh, parking as stated in the, in the layout, um, keep to no parking on Prince Street. Otherwise, there were no exceptions from the fire department, and I also don't believe there will be any, any ex uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, not exceptions. Uh, there will not be any uh, objections from any of the other town officials. Any questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Make a motion we accept the permit for the New World Festival. Second. Huh? Uh, approve. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Stand. Motion carries. And then we have a first class liquor license also for Chandler. Uh, <laughs> we have um, applied as of uh, last week. Um, through the DLC, the standard DLC uh, Department of Liquor Control process for a first class um, liquor license for Chandler, uh, primarily for the purpose of, um, and we also, as you probably well know, through the process, have to get the appropriate health department uh, approval and catering permit, and we'll be seeking those as well through the DLC and the health department, uh, primarily for the purpose of being able to serve uh, beer and wine. Uh, at uh, Chandler presentations in the main music hall and in the upper gallery moving forward. We have been working for a number of years um, with local um, caterers, including uh, Shane at One Main and um, folks at Valley Bowl Wayne um, to um, provide beer and wine for selected performances and have just, uh, our board has decided um, to uh, pursue this for um, Purposes. So we would be going through all of the uh, vetting that the, the DLC puts us through. Um, we have identified a number of people that would go through the requisite training um, on the DLC website to be able to serve. Uh, and um, so this is the first step in the process. Any questions, comments, concerns, motions? Motion to approve the request for a local license. Okay. Motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Good luck. You're welcome. I wish everything was as easy as that. <laughs> be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the Clara Martin project presentation and request. It's all about making well. good things happen, right, Tom? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> See you, Tom. That's what it's all about. Uh, if I may, I'd like to uh, preface the presentation uh, of Claire Martin. No, no, it's okay. That's fine. That um, uh, we have been active in hearing from Claire Martin Project, especially from Downstreet, the project coordinators. Uh, they have uh, also been very active with sharing information with the, uh, the Community Development Block Grant state agency uh, that will eventually make an award. Um, would also like to add that the, the select board has previously had uh, heard about this project and, and ruled on um, essentially allowing Downstreet to act as the uh, agency that manages this program. Um, so we asked uh, the project coordinators to come in and speak a little bit more about some of the troubles that they're experiencing with the renovating of the, pro of the property at 28 South Main Street. Uh, my name is Christy Everett from Clara Martin Center, um, so I'm going to be representing the project today. So where we are at this point, um, we have spent, as you know, the past couple of years working on this project, uh, securing the funding that we need for it. Um, we have secured the funding. We put the project out to bid. Um, we pre-qualified four different construction companies to help us do that. Uh, when we opened the bids last week, there was about a $265,000 uh, cost discrepancy between our uh, most recent cost estimator as well as what the bids came in at. So since then, we have been doing the work with um, the low bid contractor to do some value engineering to figure out where we can make some adjustments, where we can make some different cuts to uh, close that gap. We feel we can probably uh, close about half of the gap through that value engineering exercises we've been doing. 
the second part of the plan on how we're looking at closing that gap is actually to reach out to the funders who have previously provided their support in that. We've had some initial conversations with BHCB. Uh, they feel that they will be able to help us with some additional funding. We have had some conversations with VCDP, and that's one of uh, the main reason that I'm here tonight. They are willing to commit additional $50,000 towards the project, but it is because of their funding, it comes to you as the town, and then you subgrant that to us. So it's not an award that goes to us, it's an award that goes to you. They have previously committed just under 200000 to it. Um, in addition to that, we have had internal discussions with our Claremont Senate Board of Trustees, and we will actually be um, contributing additional funding to this as well, too. If we can close uh, this gap, we will be able to close on the Federal Housing Trust Fund within the next couple of weeks, um, and then we could potentially start construction in September with a tentative completion date, May, June time of next year. So that's generally the updated kind of where we're at at this point. Um, construction drawings have been done, they're in place, uh, we are working on all the final pieces of it, but we should be ready to go in a few weeks if we can just get this final little piece done. So your request of us tonight is if we would accept the grant if it had $50,000 more in it. Yes. That's kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> 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 Well, it's not yep. costing the town anything for <laughs> It's just pass through money. Yeah. Okay. Do you need an official motion we, to that effect? Does Adolfo have to write a letter? We would need uh, something conf confirming that the board uh, acknowledges the project um, is short of funding and approves of the project and uh, potentially increased funds through. Uh, through the state CDBG process. And then what will happen is uh, state staff will then readjust the amount that they had initially allocated for this project, uh, take the board's you know, uh, decision into consideration, and then increase the amount that is then added to the town's grant award. Similar situation as before, it probably doesn't affect anything that we might want in the future. No, uh, Nathan has been very. To that effect. You know. <laughs> oh, I'm just asking, you know. It's, I want to make sure that we're not, you know, mm -hmm. going to be held hostage down the road for something that we might want. This might play into, so. But other than that, I don't have a problem with it. So would you like to make a motion, Adolfo, authorizing uh, you to send a letter to that effect? Uh, yes, if, and it could be just anything as is, is, uh, very general as the select board motions to approve or motions to continue supporting the Clara Martin project in their new round of fundraising. And then what I will then do is take a copy of the minutes, send them over to our state partners, and then they will then work to make the amendment on their end. So motioned. <laughs> Second. So I have a motion to continue supporting the Claire Martin project. Claire Martin project and the additional funding for. Unless oh, this project has a name, is it just Claire Martin project? It's 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 28 South Main. 28 South Main. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Or 428 South Main. Yeah. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. And we have a request from the Claire Martin Center also to increase their water and sewer allocation. This um, is associated with the same project at 28 South Main. The, the, the problem that the town recently encountered with this request is not, not with the request <coughs> itself, but with our continued fight or disagreement with the Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection District. Um, that group, the Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection District, has recently issued a permit to operate to the Randolph Village water system. Uh, the permit has a condition that says that we have this permit only if we are, well, we are prohibited from allowing any new connections or any increased allocations of the water. 
um, which now complicates this request. Um, this is an issue that we've had in mm -hmm. the past with them because of our supposed manganese issue. Um, I have drafted a rather very strongly worded letter to the Drinking Water Groundwater Protection District that has yet to be sent, but essentially tells them the town is in compliance with US EPA standards. It's not our fault. The state has their own standards that violate US EPA standards, even though those were the standards that were adopted in the water supply rule. Um, I have fallen short of threatening suit or filing suit against the state, but if the board feels that it is necessary to take that next step, I will most certainly do that. But uh, at this point, our water permit will not allow us to have new connections or to even take action on this particular request for increased water allocation. We can take action on it. Well, for sure. Right? We can approve it. Can and then that it. gives you that the board's approved it, they're ready for it, you're holding us up. It's true. <coughs> this doesn't make sense, okay? You know, they, they throw that at us, but yet they're funding these projects. So sooner or later, somebody's going to get their act together up there and figure out that this is just not right. Where's Jay? <laughs> He's been there. And I know. Yeah, in the yeah. I know. We, and, you know. And we listened to this when I was up there in May. Yeah. So we had I mean, some it, this is like a, this is like a less than a, it's like a two percent increase. I yeah. just can't. So, would you like to send them a letter and ask them for their blessing, or do you just want to? Just it's just ridiculous. I mean, it's a phone call. What's up with this? You know, you, you, you're funding this project, and now you're like telling us, no, we can't. Yeah. Yeah. I've, okay. I've, I have contacted our previous supporters with the economic arm of the governor's office mm -hmm. and said, you helped us with this other project. This is a similar situation where you're now holding us up. Um, why is this in there? Many of the conditions that have been put in the permission or the permit to operate have already been completed, which are repairs to our South Reservoir making sure that it no longer leaks. So um, I, I, I don't, I, I feel that the environmental group, the environmental DEC and the Drinking Water Protection District feel that they're doing a good thing, but I think that we caught them in the situation where they moved too fast. They are now violating their own water supply rule because they're not mm -hmm. following federal regulations. We are the last town to comply with the manganese issue we're one of six, and if they now fold, because we're telling them fold, the other six towns that have borrowed money and mitigated their manganese issue now have a debt service that they have to pay and puts the state in a, in a bit of a bind. Mm -hmm. We haven't said that we're not going to mitigate it. We just said we're not going to do it as the top priority of the town. Right. So nobody's told them we're not going to do it. We're nope. just saying we're not going to do it on your timeline. I, right. yeah, we are working right. on it. We're working yeah, on we're it. Working We've on met it. with them. We have, as a matter of fact, there's another item on the agenda that addresses one of the one of the issues that they've asked us to address. So we we're, we're working with them, but this was changing the pumping schedule and all these things. So aren't we doing all that? We're doing all that. Yeah. So I, I I'm like you know like I said I think we need to approve it and see better to ask for forgiveness. What are they going to do? Right. They're going to just pull, us, pull the plug on us and say, sorry, we're not going to help you? I don't think that's going to happen. Well, we, it, the board absolutely can approve it. There would be no case to find the town unless we actually started the increased allocation. Okay. Portion of it, so. so one other point. When do you actually need this allocation? I mean, you don't need this right now, do you? Uh, do you need it to move the project forward, or is this something where you could come back in you know six months? Right? Even uh, giving them the allocation has zero impact on the system because yeah. they aren't actually using it. They're not using it anything. So we can give them the allocation, be, they can meet their permit requirements. And You're not anticipating actually being connected for some time, right? Yeah, we don't expect the project to be completed until probably May, June time. It's going to be completely under construction until then in rehab. And nobody will know anyway. No. Nope. At the state level. What are they going to know? What are they going to know? But the paperwork will be We have videotape. Yeah, we have videotape. In bathrooms? No, no. <laughs> no. no. The meeting. The meeting. Oh. Bring it on. I move we approve the increase in allocations for water and sewer for 28 South Main Street. I second. 
Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carried. We understand that there's like you know, 10,000 gallons here, but we're talking you know, less than 1%. Okay, before we get into the next item, I'd like to move down to old business, the water bill abatement for 8 Railroad Street. Unless you want to sit through the rest of these items. <laughs> oh, thank you. Aren't you learning a lot, though, Shane? I am. Okay. Every day. Every day. It's, it's a Especially this evening. Mm -hmm. Especially this evening. Mm -hmm. Is that why you've never run for select board? <laughs> <laughs> March is coming. Mm. Okay. So there's some history to this one. There's a lot of history this to this This is one. the property that burnt. Yep. Back in 2001. And the service was not disconnected so the fees continued to build. well everything was shut off to the building so the roof burned off from it the whole upper floor burnt um, electricity was cut cable water was shut off um, there was no utilities it, that were on in on as far as a faucet in there but the water was still right. on at the street stop Nope. Right. It, it wasn't it was disconnected. not on at the street stop. It never has been on from the street stop. For as long as I've owned that building. Has it ever been disconnected? Physically disconnected? No. Um, there's no plumbing in the building. There's... Okay, the building's been gutted. From the time of the fire, fees continued because the service wasn't disconnected or right. it, 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 turned the, off. The line was not dug up out of the ground. So then you came and saw us about 18, 20 months ago. Yeah, it was like probably two years ago now, and the board agreed that with the improvements to 8 Railroad Street, that it was no more than a shed. And at that time, they agreed to abate the bill as long as I dug up the line and capped it so I didn't have access to water. Even though it's been shut off and I hadn't had access to water for 16 years now. What did you have to do to the building? We didn't just say dig up the water and cap it. You were going to make the building No, this is, that's the second meeting. So, so the first meeting that I came to, you agreed that <clears throat> you would stop billing and I would be taken off the system. Okay, so I would have to dig up the line physically, cap it at the main, and then when and if I ever wanted to reconnect, I would pay the allocation fee to reconnect. That was two meetings ago. The last meeting, um, because I didn't want to have to dig up this line, I was trying to negotiate with the board. Um, not to have to physically do that because literally, I mean, I'll have to do it eventually anyway because that line is so old going from your system to my building. Um, I'd never be able to put that building back in service with the line that's there anyway. And so you came back because you didn't want to dig it up and then what's your, what was the deal that was cut? So the deal that was cut the last time around was that if I made my building, I guess, more presentable, um, the board would also waive the past water and sewer bill. Um, and I guess my argument is, is that, I mean, I've been billed, um, of this water and sewer bill and I get these minimum usage fees uh, for the past 16 years um, and I've never had even the ability to use the Randolph Town Hall. I've never used a drop of water or sewer at the 8 Railroad Street So we property. went through all this argument last time, yep. correct? Yep. And we had an agreement. And we started with 12 months, and you said, no, 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 give me 18. But yep. I gave you 18. 
in yep. 18 months you were going to improve the way that building looked mm -hmm. and in return for you doing that the town would forgive all the back fees but if it didn't get done the fees were all due and payable yep. so now we're at 18 months plus yep. and none of the work was done correct correct Which I I came back and, and met with Adolfo in May and talked about, you know, the progress over there. And I told him that I'd been extremely busy and that, you know, I hadn't had the time to side and paint the building. Um, and then he said, well, let's refer back to the, um, the contract. And the contract stated, once I read through it a second time, it said that I actually had to have occupancy um, through the town, okay, which was a different thing than what I understood from the initial meeting. And I don't know if that got lost in translation when it got written up, um, but that's a big difference between siding, painting the outside of the building. So either way, you haven't done anything. And you set the deadline of 18 months we gave you an extra six months on top of what we had originally talked about. And you committed to having it done. I haven't had time in 18 months to get to it. Isn't holding a lot of water because we've been through this and through this and through this. It's awesome. got to be resolved and we can't just keep saying 18 months, 18 months. Right, but <laughs> I mean, I'm. I'm as far as the appearance of the building goes, I mean, I have, I put tens of thousands of dollars into that building to even get it to where it is now. Um, you know, with a roof put on it, <clears throat> gutting the interior, getting all the garbage out of there, cleaning up the exterior. Um, I have done a lot of work, not in the last 18 months, but from the time that I purchased it up until now, I have That's all good, Shane, but 18 months ago, you sat here, we had a negotiation, and we had a deal. And you signed to that deal. And then you left here and did nothing. Until your time expired, and now you're in here saying, Well, that's not absolutely true, because like time. I said, I met with Adolfo in May. You did to nothing that you agreed to in the building in 18 months. How many times can we renegotiate something to Well, I mean, nothing. I would wish that the select board would abate this bill entirely, okay? <clears throat> the simple fact that I haven't had, you know, any ability to use the water there ever. And but you that did. this you bill is just allocation. kept with accruing. I mean, like, even the current bill that I have now, I mean... The past two balance says 3800 Outstanding interest is $1,350. You um, had that allocation. You owned that allocation to the system. The and allocation that for that fee. building, for what was there, and we had Marty in here on the, on the last meeting, would cost a third of what that bill is. But it's there because of your inaction. If you wanted to get rid of that allocation, shut it down and walk away, the time to have taken that action was shortly after the fire. Not now, after we've had how we've hashed these details. Yeah, well, this has also times. been a learning experience on both ends because most people here even can't explain to me the whole allocation process, okay, that the town has on the books. And like this billing has always been taken back to this is an allocation billing and it's billed as a minimum usage month after month after month when I can't go into my building and turn on the water. So you just saw us increase the allocation to the Claire Martin Center. Right. So when you connect to the water and sewer, you get a minimum, you get an allocation to your building and it's based on whether it's the size of the residence, the business, the uses, whatever. And a lot of that comes from the state statute. Mm -hmm. So the state statute dictates what you come in and say, oh, I want to do a restaurant in there. 
we get those numbers from the state because you have to pay state allocation fee. Right. So you're in this. So whatever the allocation is, I don't even know what the allocation is to your building. It's about fifteen hundred bucks. But I'm not what what the use was is what I'm saying. So I don't know what your use was, but I you know I'm kind of agree with Trina here. If you were not going to move forward with improving the building to get it to a point where well, you were going to use the allocation, that's really not the select board or the town's fault. The well, minimum usage is a fee that you pay as the holder of the allocation for the to have access to that allocation. So if you want to go turn the water on, it's there. If you hooked your pipes the, up, what you're the water for. was there for you. No, I understand that. That's and what I, your minimum I, fee I is. I paid for that. I mean, like, it's not that I haven't paid bills on this property. I paid twenty five hundred dollars already in receipts that I can show you for this allocation fee that costs fifteen hundred dollars. Okay, this is an additional fifty four hundred dollars on top of it, which makes this allocation that's so valuable at fifteen hundred bucks cost. You know, but it's because of how you manage this. Shit. That was your decision. When that property burnt, the decision was yours whether to disconnect from the system because you were never going to do anything with the building or to keep that allocation. It's not fair to the other users for us to just say, oh, you're right, you can hold your allocation and not pay any fees to have that allocation. And someday, 20 years from now, when you decide to do something and want water back in the building, just go and do the plumbing and turn the faucet on. When you hold that allocation, you pay that minimum user fee every month, whether you use it or not. Okay. And that's the fees that you have there. But you didn't take any action to have it shut off or to be disconnected from the system. So when you say, if I had a new allocation, it would be $1,500, you're right. You should have disconnected shortly after the fire. Well, no. I mean, like two years ago when you guys agreed that I'd dig it up and cap it at the at the source, at the shutoff, you said you'd waive it doing that, and that had nothing to do with improving the building. Okay, that was that was the first meeting that you guys all agreed that all I had to do was cap it, which means I had to dig the ground up in front of the building to physically cap it. And my argument at the time was, well, I can't turn the water on and I can't use it anyway. Like what difference does it make if I dig the ground up and cap it physically at the shutoff? And I think it's more just a logistical thing on your guys' end that that's what you want to see done. And so I guess my argument is, is that, you know, like there's two directions you can go in it. And the, the second was a renegotiation because I didn't want to have to dig up the ground and cap it at the, <coughs> at the source. But it sounds like to me that that's probably the cheaper option and that you guys had already agreed to two meetings ago. Shane, we sat here that night that you came back and didn't want to do that deal. And you sat right here and you told us what you wanted. And then you took a break and we went on to other agenda items. And you came back and said, I will do this, but I need 18 months. And we agreed. There was discussions at every single one of those. I went round and round chasing this, all these same topics. And we came to a resolution. So and you on, went away so, for 18 months with that agreement. Okay, so on, on, on your end, you just think I should pay the $5,400? It was what you agreed to do. Well, I mean, if that's what you want is the money, Right. The outstanding balance is thirty-eight, thirty-four, eighty-seven, without the interest and penalties. Would you concede to the thirty-eight, thirty-four, eighty-seven? I'll write you a check tomorrow, and this will be concluded. And then, are you going to disconnect from the system, or are you going to continue to pay well, the bill? Well, no, that would be my choice because then all my allocation would be paid up in full. But and, and, and no, your minimum, you're, you're going to get whacked no, no. With minimum yeah, every and month. So then my, and then my minimum billing, I would have the choice of either digging it up and capping it to stop the billing. Or if that's what... Or, if, or I could continue the billing at the minimum 100 and... 
$35 a quarter from then on out. But I would pay the 38, 34, 87 and get this taken care of. Does the select board have the authority to do that without it going to the water sewer committee first? I think it would have to first go to the water sewer committee mm -hmm. and work its way up through the process. Because it's considered an abatement. <clears throat> yep. Well, I've been to several of those meetings, and every one of those meetings, they just make recommendations. They don't actually rule on anything as far as monetarily, and then it comes back to the select board for the true vote. And this was the same thing that happened the last two times when you guys agreed to um, a partial abatement. But I believe they supported it when it came to us. That's what we right. need from them, right? So I think I would suggest that you go down that path and Adelvo can help you with that and then we can see where we're at with that situation. And that I think that's where I stand with this. You know, if, if the water sewer board decides or feels that they would support that, then I think I would be fine with it. So, but I want to hear what they've got to say, so. My, but my only requirement would be that at this point in time, so we don't get caught in this trap again, I would suggest that you disconnect from the system at that point. That would be what I would want to see. Well, it's either that or you just pay the minimum. Only, bill because, and it out. only because I wasn't privy to the conversations that were had here before, okay? Yeah, but that, I, that's just going to be his decision. That's his decision. Whether, whether you think it's a good idea or not. Well, I'm just saying, no, it's, I mean, just, it's part of the deal. He's so we're, do, but we're abating a situation here, or we could potentially be abating a situation where he already cut a deal. Okay, he didn't follow through with the deal, so I would like to say, hey, you know, if you want to, if, that's the, if, if you're looking for the abatement, I want another piece of the puzzle. I want you off the system, and you come back and you reapply for an allocation. That's, that's the only reason I'm suggesting that we take that well, into consideration. Well, if, you, if your end goal well, Only because be, you're going to get caught but again. But then that'll, that'll be for us to talk about at our next meeting after this. That year, certainly could happen, yeah. But I, I, so we, nobody gets caught in the same situation again. That would be my suggestion. That way there's no bill. There's no ongoing... Fees that aren't getting paid, you know. So I don't know. Well, That's, two meetings ago, Perry. I mean, you, I wasn't here, so I. I know you weren't, but so, the, the board at the time agreed that if, if that was done, they would have baited the whole past bill entirely. Guess you should have done it. Well, in hindsight, obviously. I I guess I need to review the minutes of the from the of the two meetings that you were here, so I can get a better clear understanding of what actually happened but you know I'm going upon what Trini remembers and so she was here at the time so it would be my suggestion be quite a somewhere on it. it would be my suggestion that you you know if you want to get it abated that you talk to the water sewer board I believe it went to them abatements go to them first right I think that's your, your first stop is with them to see if they would abate the interest and penalties piece of it if you paid the rest in full. It sounds like you're getting some willingness to do that if it goes through that committee. They oversee the allocations and the, the funding needed to keep that system running. That's why they get a say in making a recommendation to abate or to raise concerns with why when they don't want to. That's what the well, I know. I've been, I've been to the Water and Sewer Board several times over this. But with a request for the abatement on the interest or just yes. to discuss it? Well, I guess I wasn't. Because at some point in time in the history, it was actually illegal to charge interest and penalties on the water and sewer bill, period, and then, so they abated it at that time, the interest and penalties, that was it. And then the town went and updated their water and sewer law to allow them to continue to do it again. And that's where all the, the interest and penalties are coming from. 
so Shane, just just my perspective. I mean, if this was just a gentleman's handshake or something, I would I would understand, you know, your request saying, you know, misunderstand. The truth is, is that this expired, and you know now it's coming up, and now it's to me it's written signed by you. It's even worse than just uh, you know not paying. I know you got me. So that's I'm not. You, I mean, you're, I'm you're not right. trying I mean, to. It, it's, and I understand everybody's law. busy and, dr and and growing a business. I, I get it, you know. So I'm I'm all in favor of the business side. That's that's the only thing I'm struggling with, honestly. Is like I said, in the end, how, how many abatements still, is there? I, I'll, I'll have paid, you know, no, understood. Seventy five hundred dollars or more to keep a fifteen hundred dollar allocation. Right. Right. Oh. Business choices made, right? I, I get it. Right. And so, but that's the way I think about things is on a business level. Like, I'm not the select board, right? I'm a business owner. And, and when you entered into this agreement, you made a business decision. And then it was a bad decision right in hindsight. And now you want us to be responsible for your bad decision. I don't think you're responsible for my bad decision, but you want us I am to make you whole because of it. It just seems like, you know, I, I wish that I could go back to people, you know, who I made agreements with and that were bad in retrospect and say, oh, you know what, I, I kind of screwed that up. Can I, can you give me something anyway? Because, you know, I was acting in good faith. I just made a mistake. And, you know, typically the answer is, well, no, like, it's just well, done. We did, we did if this. I've been using water at that location all this I time, I, I, or I, even I, had the ability to use the water I'm, at that location all this time, I think I would think differently about it. Yeah, I hear that, but then you do have the ability to use water at the location. I it's, a, it's a little hex nut valve. You have the plumbing inside. You can use it. No, because it's shut off by the town. It's never been turned back on, and I'm right. not the authority to turn it back on. But I'm just the saying. I'm saying technically, you do have the ability. I'm not saying you would. I'm not saying it's legal. I'm, I'm not going to dress up all black. And, well, and, and if that. you did the work you needed to on the inside, and you called the town and said, "Hey." I'm ready for you to go turn the water back on, it would be turned back on. Correct. So you had the ability to access the water. We've had this discussion. We've gone through all these details. We've hashed it and hashed it and hashed it, and it keeps coming out. To, you know, we sat here. Everything was talked about. You took extra time. You came back and asked us to give you six more months than what was originally discussed. We agreed to do that. It got reduced to writing between you and Mel. You read it, you went through it with him, you signed it, you did all that. I mean, it's, if you want to and, proceed. And I also talked to Adolfo in May about coming in to get an extension, and I tried to get on last month's agenda, and I got in all my paperwork, plenty of in, in time in advance, and I didn't get on the meeting before the contract expired. And then the contract expired, and I'm here the very next month. So I was trying to get here, and he's got the paperwork in his desk. My, you know, well before last month's meeting, I I wasn't pushing it off to the last minute, and I had talked about it with him in May, and I've been in his office. I don't even know how many times since then about other projects, and it has come up, and so. I think your first stop is to the Water and Sewer Committee to see if they'll abate the interest and penalties. And then I think you have another business decision to make, a couple of them. Because as of right now, if you don't pay it, you'll be back in the same boat you were in January of 17. It'll be back up for sale. Well, I, so you I, I can know the pay process. it or go for sale. And then you get to decide to stay connected to keep your allocation or disconnect from the system and pay the monthly bills or quarterly bills. So that's where I'm at. Same place. So I think that's what you need to do. Take your request of Modalfo to get on the water sewer committee's agenda and Move there first. When do they meet again? Do you know? I don't know. I'll speak with Marty, and I think it's very much a uh, as on an as-needed basis. So 
Yes. We can Probably schedule a meeting relatively then. quickly yeah. for the warning. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Randolph Road Culvert Grant B Trans. We have been working with B Trans on uh, on this particular project. We had previously brought it to the board, asking for approval to apply for the grant. We applied. We were denied. Um, we were persistent and invited our representative to come down and tour some of our project sites. He saw what we saw, and um, well, the grant was then subsequently awarded to the town. And so if the board approves, we can then make use of the grant and start working on replacing the culvert on North Randolph Road. Nice. This is classified as a <laughs> It seems to me. Your turn. You can make a <laughs> location with this down by Peter Road or uh little like I don't know the exact location, but it is it's it's way to, it's way out there. Um, I'll get too far out there. You yeah, well, it's not really that far out there yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, I, 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 Mason Road comes to mind, but I know it's way further out than that. Then which road? Mason, I think. Mason's in a different part of town. Yeah, I, I just, uh, it's <laughs> on the other side. So. Do you want to make a motion to accept it? Move we accept the grant for the structure on North Randolph Road. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained. Motion carries. Thank you. State revolving loan fund agreement for the new well, Pearl Street well project. So this circles back to the work that we've been performing with State Revolving Loan Fund staff and also the Drinking Water Groundwater Protection District. Uh, one of the next steps is to um, investigate alternatives that will allow the town to grow for the future. We understand that our North Reservoir is for the most part beyond its useful life, which is one of the reasons why it's leaking. Um, one of the proposals that we would like to investigate is to build smaller cell reservoirs so that we can use those and if we need more we can build them as we go along. Um, the state approved of that. Uh, they also approved of our proposed plan to build towards the future with money being, um, well, the frugalness uh, of the town being a priority so we just don't overspend. Um, one of the requests was that we then investigate these options through our existing engineering firm, the Dufresne Group. Dufresne Group came back to us and said, in order for us to be able to investigate these options and work with what the town wants to do with drinking water and groundwater protection district, it would cost an additional $30,000. This would be added to the 191,000 that was initially awarded or approved, the select, approved by the select board. So we're not paying any debt service on it yet. It will all eventually be rolled into the total amount that would be due for all repairs. Taking the three wells and putting them online, potentially building the new North Reservoir, um, and all the other connections that go along with it. Mm -hmm. yep. So I'm sorry, has any of that 191 been spent already? It's just an allocation. Almost all of it. All has been spent, yeah, with the exception of roughly about a thousand dollars, I believe. But the entire 191 has been spent. Okay. All right. And then, how does this gets paid for from water bill usages and stuff? That's how. Yeah, yeah. it'll essentially get rolled into the total cost of the bill. Um, well, it, for example, if we do not apply for any grants, if we do not apply for any free money, so to speak, it will all be paid for by the ratepayers. 
Uh, we have had commitments from various state groups that have offered to provide low interest. Um, well, they, they offered to consider us for a negative interest mm -hmm. loan, which would essentially be a, a grant in some ways. Um, we've also worked with the community development block grant staffers and essentially said to them, we are going to be applying for grant money. Um, so even though the overall project would likely cost a million dollars, um, we're hoping that all of the grant money that we're able to apply for and the ne negative interest loan that we're able to obtain will bring that cost down considerably. We still don't know exactly what the cost of the project will be, which is going to be an end result of a lot of the engineering assessments that needs to be done. We tried, I tried to get some of this work done in-house and our engineer felt that she would not be able to actually do all the necessary work because of some of the intricacies that are dealt with our engineering firm. So we have to go, uh, we can't do it, any of it in-house. Mm -hmm. And what is the time frame for having to take action on actually doing something? I mean, before they say, you know, that North Reservoir is just not operational. Uh, so we don't have an exact, we, we know how old it is, and it's over 40 years old. We know that it has some rust issues. We do know that some of the leaks are in areas where we really just can't access. Um, and we don't know how much it would cost to repair it uh, because we can't, can't find where the leak is. Yeah. Um, there's also a liner within the North Reservoir that we had to put in previously. Um, there's also a considerable amount of sediment in there that is making it hard for us to just throw into the. Dr uh, they have these underwater drones that essentially would just go in there and look for a leak, but because there's so much sediment in there from just sediment, um, years anything that goes into the water will kick up the sediment and it just makes it hard to find the leak. I guess I'm just thinking that, I mean, I don't, I'm don't. i not in the water district, so I don't appreciate those fees that happen right, to folks, but mm -hmm. I have heard considerable about, uh, amount of uh, concern about the bills that would happen when the new sep uh, water treatment plant went in. Yeah. And then, you know, if we're investigating this, spending more money on this, and then now planning on short-term putting some water facility structure in, yeah. I'm just wondering what that impact would be and those the are concerns one, that those same folks would have. I, I agree. Those are one of the points that we raise with the drinking water, ground water projected district, will say to them, we don't service the entire town. And their response to us is, well, this is a town benefit the town should pay, as opposed to just the rate payers. So their response is, the town should pay. Or you have to do this because our water quality standards say you're in violation of our water quality standards. Um, we agree to disagree on those points. The only thing we you know, agree on is that they feel we have to pay and they could potentially make us. Well, they could make us in that they keep incurring fines. Um, we could just continue to provide water normally, but they could also stick it to the town by not letting us apply for state grants, mm -hmm. other payments that we receive from the state. They can get us in that way, but we would still be providing water. But we did work with them on another way of managing the times mm -hmm. right. when the water is being pumped from different places and bringing the new ones on and whatnot, which, according to their analysis, we wouldn't need the Pearl Street. They have since point. backed off from that. Um, they did provide us the presentation that they showed us in Montpelier for that meeting. Yeah. Um, I then asked them to provide us with the raw data because if we didn't have to have our engineers do this work, we didn't have to pay for it. Um, Brian Redmond's response, who's the director of the agency, said, well, our staff will work with your engineers to come up with very accurate numbers, but we are not going to do the work for the town. Essentially telling us, you know, we will give you the avenue to borrow money to have this work done, but our engineers will not be the lead in obtaining this data. We will only help in obtaining this data. So... Mm -hmm. Frustrating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, you kind of got to do it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. And I think, you know, there was conversations about multiple sources of funding to work on the projects when we were there. So in that meeting, they seemed willing to 
even you know Josh Hanford's department was you know yeah twisting around a little bit. So you know they saw it as an economic economic development piece that they felt strongly enough about that needed to be you know that we could work with. So so all right, so we do the work and got to do something, right? So. I would make the motion to authorize Adelpho to obtain the additional thirty thousand dollars from the revolving loan fund for that purpose. I'll second that. Motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. And thinking. Opposed. <laughs> Tired. Aye. Uh, no. I just. I'm not sure. I understand the impact. That's all. The big impact isn't yet. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no. It's the answers we it's get the from answers this. answers will be the impact. Yeah. Is, that, is that five, three, zero, three, yeah, zero, I'm two, in. five? I'm in. Four? Four, zero, one? <laughs> if you don't vote, it's automatically a yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> for, for whatever it's worth, I... I'm more frugal with the town's money than I am with my own, and I am pretty, you know. So I, and I, I, I have pushed and will continue to push with the state, and I, you know, I, I, if the board would like, it would share the letter that I drafted. You know, I would certainly pass it around for review, but it, it is very strongly worded, and it, it is accusing the state of really putting their foot in, on the town's throats um, because the water district does provide water to some of the town's poorest population. And if we are going to ask them to pay an additional million dollars, uh, add that to to water rates, then it really puts a whole lot of pressure. They know um, this. That's why we were chosen as an opportunity zone. It's not it's not rocket science that no. there. No. It was very surprising, though, to see their requirement to not allow us to connect, add new yeah, connections. I think it's a little. Yeah, that was, yeah. What's not, what is the opportunity zone? I guess I'm not. No, the opportunity, yeah. opportunity zone. So Randolph was designated an opportunity zone, which is an opportunity for <coughs> people it's who are. It's a federal designation. It's a, designation it's a federal to get designation funding. that gives yeah, the that opportunity, gives people, right? Investors at the federal tax credit. Okay. So the tax credits are coming from somebody who might be paying capital gains. So as an opportunity zone, they can make an investment into this region, into this zone, okay, which then gives them these tremendous tax benefits over, you know, if they leave the money in for over 10 years, they're not paying the gains. Gotcha. The rules are still being written, but, you know, we were chosen because we were a area that needed some assistance. Opportunity, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Hey, special appropriation policy update. So I just... Uh, oh. From the previous meeting, I had shared with the board that our attorney had reviewed uh, the proposed changes, uh, but that his um, structural changes or formatting changes did not arrive in time to be able to include them in the packet. Uh, I just included the return document that the attorney had sent to us, and the changes remain the same, which is just the, the date uh, at the top section of it, and then also the added language. That is, uh, all the changes have the vertical line on the left-hand right, side yeah. of the paper. Yeah. Um, and so the changes remain the same from what we had uh, spoken about at the last select board meeting, only now the return document is in a different format. And the change, uh, I don't have it memorized, but the change would give the select board the opportunity to... Um, allow someone to have a special appropriations request, uh, but if they also sought um, direct funding through the budget, would give the select board the ability to then subtract the amount of money they received from the budget from their special appropriations amount. Mm -hmm. okay. On that one? No. I'll move that we accept.
accept the changes to the special appropriation policy. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Carries. We have an agreement renewal for Orange County Sheriff for outside of the police district. Uh, yes, this uh, renewal uh, happens every year per the request of the Orange County Sheriff's Department. It is just for traffic enforcement. Um, there is a capped amount yearly. Um, it is uh, up to $15,000. And this is to issue tickets, deal with speed um, demons, we like to call them, because apparently there are quite a few of them in, in the areas that are patrolled by the Orange County Sheriff's Department outside of the village. Um, the, there is one change in that the previous uh, agreement listed a an amount of 42, 43. It's listed in 43. pencil at the very top. Yeah, the increases in the total amounts. 43 to 46, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, previous the previous contracts uh, two contracts ago was 42 dollars. The most recently expired contract is $43 per hour, and now it is $46 per hour. And that $46 amount is consistent with the rate that we're currently paying for contract services in the village. So if the board were to approve the agreement, it would be retroactive to the council or the expiration of the previous agreement. I'll make a motion to approve that. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. We have the item added, which is the bid for the septic to the garage. Uh, yes. The town, prior to my arrival, had identified uh, structural deficiencies in the Randolph Center garage. There were some uh, old septic uh, tanks that. Um, we're mixing in with the oil disposal systems and it was just not a uh, pretty sight. There were separate issues. One in the, um, <coughs> the storage area that was the former highway garage that ran off center closest to Rand Road. And the, that has already been corrected and resolved. This current contract would be for the area uh, which we now use for the Rand Center garage. Um, there again is uh, the failed septic system. We're forced to add some redesigning so that we could have um, a functioning system up there. We had budgeted, or my predecessor had budgeted upwards of $60,000 for the project. Uh, we received bids, and the bids are in your packets, which are well below what was planned for. Um, we would like the board, even though the the lowest bid is, I believe, thirty-two thousand uh, yeah. dollars. We would like the board to potentially authorize up to a forty-five thousand dollars expenditure, um, so that we could potentially also upgrade the apron that leads out of the garage and onto the the dirt road area. We don't believe that we will use all forty-five thousand dollars, but uh, because there are some variances where. The apron on the outside of the building goes from its most narrow point from roughly about 30 feet to about 45 feet. Uh, we don't believe we're going to do that same apron because it may not be necessary, but if it is necessary, it would be upwards of $45,000. Uh, if it's not, it'll be well below that, but the contractor has said that even if we add that additional apron cost, it won't exceed more than $45,000. So, so do we know why there's, I mean... Sixteen thousand dollar discrepancy between the two bids. It's pretty significant for such a defined yeah, project. 50%. Yeah, mm -hmm. I we don't know. It's same scope. Just, of work same scope. All attended the same meeting. They looked at the same material. They looked at the same work. Um, they had the same amount of time to submit questions um, to to our town engineer. Um, it just came back. So when they submit bids back, do they say, hey, we're going to use this much gravel and this much whatever and this much? I mean, with them when they would come back, I mean, is that a no? If it's lump sum, no. No. They essentially just say that we will comply with the scope of the work that the town wants. There are a lot of firms that are very busy, and prices and construction projects have shot up this year. Okay. Just, just big deal. I wasn't... Yeah. For that amount of money, it's pretty significant. Yeah. There were some... 
in the last project that we were that the board reviewed was uh, the pavement project on Furnace Street uh, or Furnace Road. Uh, those those contract all those bids also came back varying, but just not by this much. I mean, yeah. There were some that were considerably higher than the lowest bidder, but this was a huge difference. And we were detailed enough in our bid that went out. I mean, in the respect that went out with the requirements to say. Yeah, that it'll meet the requirements that we have to. Yeah. And those were all prepared by Pathways, not us. They handled all the bid phase. I believe so, yeah. So make a motion to approve the $45,000 allocation to cover the cost. Right, that's which one, the 45? Yep. Yep. A second. Motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Other business? Town meeting follow up. Did I miss one? <laughs> you did. Wait until you see what you got volunteered for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I've got this before you go. Uh, at the last town meeting in March, the residents had posed a question to the select board about the possibility of changing the date of town meeting from Tuesday, the day of, of, of voting, to a weekend day to encourage more people to attend town meeting. Um, we, the town clerk and I, thought it would be a good idea to bring it up for discussion now because we recently learned that there was an error committed by town staff in submitting a tax abatement form um, for consideration on the ballot. The Randolph Senior Center typically submits a uh, question to have their, essentially their tax abated because they provide a service. Um, our town clerk believes that she received the form. In fact, she says that she knows that she received the form, but does not know what happened from when she received it to the ballot process. Uh, we don't know if it was given to Shannon's predecessor and then it was just lost in the shuffle during that whole process, but because that form never, for that form was never processed and the question was never put on the ballot, the taxes for the Randolph Senior Center are now in effect. And now they are on the hook for taxes for the property. Um, Town feels that because the error was committed, at least as confirmed by the town clerk, that she received the form. We don't know what happened. Um, if the board wanted to hold a special meeting to consider the question posed by the residents, we could, and then also at the same time, have the question posed to the residents of, do we want to abate taxes for the Randolph Senior Center? Other options that we're um, considering is whether we could just allow the tax to continue not put the property up for sale, and then at the next uh, town meeting, put a ballot question that says taxes for the previous year would be abated, and then also taxes for the next agreement would be in effect, essentially making it a tax-free facility. I think personally, I'd want to vote sooner because if the town, for whatever reason, voted it down, the, the impact would be greater, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? Or the known impact, the plan, plan for the impact would be greater. It's right hard way. to get people to donate to overdue debt. Yeah. Whereas if you were happen to raise the money to meet your current property, your property tax, it's easier probably to fundraise for that. Hmm. That's a floor question, or is that a paper ballot question? Could be a floor question. Yeah, Our, the clerk is still working to identify the actual, whether it's Australian ballot or floor, but she believes it would be floor. We have yet to confirm that. If it was uh, Australian ballot, we could vote it in November. Yeah, yeah that's what I was thinking. I was just... Hmm. We could absolutely do that. Mm -hmm. That, that might be the, That'd be the easiest. most effective, cheapest way to handle the situation is just vote in November. 
one more yeah. piece of paper to hand everybody, but I don't think anybody's gonna. Simple. I don't think anybody's. Yeah, I think it's relatively <coughs> easy, painless. There is also the issue of town staff looking to have available bond money from the Chelsea Mountain Road project that we completed, uh, made available to the Elm Street Prospect project that we're working on now. So we're also trying to figure out if that's something that we can put on a ballot. We have to bring it to the board later for approval, but it could happen at the same time. It could all happen at the same that time. That is a ballot question. Yeah, yeah it's not a floor question. Yeah, it's, it's a not ballot a floor question. question. Yeah. Okay. Well, that would be the direction I would go for. Well, that's easy. Well, that solves those, but it doesn't solve the day to have town meeting on. No. No. It, one of the concerns that was brought up during the previous town meeting was that if the board waited until the next town meeting, mm -hmm. it would have to be held on a Tuesday, and then only then would the change happen, but then it wouldn't happen for the next town meeting day, which would be two years out. Why couldn't we make that a ballot question? That could be a ballot question. Did you make that a ballot question? They can... Mm -hmm. I don't know if we could. I mean, I, I could double check. You want to check that out? Because if you could make yeah. that a ballot question, and, and, you know, so then you could put it on the ballot, you know, would the town... It could be a non-binding question. It could be, it could be a, yeah, it could be a non-binding question. If it has then, to be. Huh? Maybe. If it has to be. Yeah. And then, then it's kind of like I have getting a survey. <laughs> You're going to like have people that are going to want both. Oh, yeah, you know, it's going to go gonna both be ways. One group this way, one group that way. Yeah. It's well, I, I, I do hear a lot of people talk about not being able to, able to participate yeah. on Tuesday well, because not everybody gets Tuesday off to well, go to town meeting. Not, or, yeah. Yeah, most, most people. Or in the evening. That was another comment was, you know, why wouldn't we do town meeting in the evening? Because you're near the end of the poll time. Uh, the poll time was the, people, that was the. You go through each of the questions on the ballot. Mm hmm. So you have to finish before the polls, the polls are finished. But some towns hold town meeting the night before, too, right? Yeah. So. If the board likes, I could explore placing them all on the ballot yeah. as a question. Does the board have the authority to change that date? Uh, the, the meeting itself, believe it, it has the authority. Yeah. You want to find that out for us? Yep. We can pretend to. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> Until somebody says it's not legal would, and everything you voted on doesn't count. <laughs> um, I'd be s slightly reluctant, at least, that we should talk about a little more. Like, if we do decide to put it on the ballot, that, you know, it sounded like Adolfo was suggesting that we might have three options on the ballot, but that just makes things really complicated. What if, you know, it's easy to imagine a situation where we could put two items on the ballot, right? Leave it the way it is or change it to Saturday, and the town votes by a significant margin to change it to Saturday. Or we, you know, put three questions on, including the night before option, and those two options, you know, Saturday and the night before then, get split, and then it's less than keep it the where, where it is. But most people still want to change the mm -hmm. date, but then it's not really clear exactly well, you know, you know, what the will right. of the... Consensus is I think we just do one option, because we still have to do the meeting, the informational meeting, as well, and that's the one we typically do the night before you vote. Right. Yeah. For the two people that have questions on the budget. Mm -hmm. Right, but we're still required to have <laughs> Still required yeah. to do it. <laughs> but you could, so if you have to change that, that so it was part of the town bill, well, you can't. What's that change? Yeah, I don't know. And we can discuss, we could discuss the budget during town meeting. Right, so you could, it yeah. might make a you late can night. Now. You can now. To, it might get us out of having to do that meeting that we don't get anything out of. Or it might make that Double meeting take a lot longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're moving to a Saturday, we make town meeting a lot longer anyway. The last one was like I'm all four hours. Oh, oh, just instead of having Kelly's long. coffee <laughs> hour, we can have, we can maybe, have Kelly's dinner hour. Maybe a little bit longer already. <laughs> I'm thinking more people participate, the better. <laughs> four hours. Right? My intuition says that if, if it was okay. longer, it wouldn't be dramatically longer, <laughs> just because more people were there. A new spot. Okay. 
I would certainly like to pursue it because I do think a lot of people feel like they don't get the opportunity. So, you know, try it for, well, see what happens. Try it. If you go to town meeting, it's really obvious, you know, most people there are people who, you know, get the day off. Are, have the day off. Lots of those are, it's because they're not working anymore. Right. It's a huge, so I would, huge I, percentage of the town meeting day is people who are retired. Yeah, I would love to see it, it go to an evening or Saturday. I'd love to see more people at town meeting. At least give the people the opportunity. Now it's their choice, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's their choice, you know, so. Unless they work Saturdays and not Tuesdays. Yeah, but you only vote on like five things on the floor. Yeah, but and there's a lot of discussion that happens. Things. There's a lot of questions. You know, it's generally, it generally lasts a while. So people get answers. I mean, look, last year we talked about the fire stuff for how long? Right? Yeah. Bond, <laughs> bond stuff, right. Right. But we could have done that at the meeting the night before. I understand I that. Don't, I don't but think it changes, but I'm willing to If they get one opportunity. It, but I just don't think it changes. No, it doesn't change much, I think, but I think it just gives more people the opportunity to come. That would be yeah, my that's, my that's, only motivation for thinking that is, like, put it on a Saturday so that way no one can say, you know, I had to work. Because except for those people who work on Saturdays. Well, maybe who work on Saturdays in case, or but but they could you know they could maybe make the effort. Who knows? And you know it's going to be the first gorgeous day of the weekend, and nobody's going to show and up. And nobody's going to show up. Go somewhere right, probably. Right. Probably want to go skiing or something if it's March. But okay. I think you should try it. It was talked about, so it's been talked about for years, as I recall. I like the idea of printing it on a ballot and letting, letting with two choices. It, but yeah, I think yeah, so. I think so. So let's eliminate Tuesday altogether. Hmm? Give them the choice the night before or Saturday. Yeah. And then see how many write-ins you get for Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Writing campaign comes out. We're all in trouble. So then we'd be saying that we're going to change it. We just want to know which day you want to change it to. Yes. Unless you were to so say if we if we changed it. Yeah, it can be non-binding. It could be three items. Typically what would happen is the first question would be, do you want to change town meeting day? And then if enough people say yes, then the two options come into play the night before or the Saturday before. But if, say for example, 100 people vote, yeah, one zero for any of the options, but th the first question fails, then town meeting day will still Stay be on Tuesday. Tuesday. Is that going to be another ballot that we have to hand count, or can it run can through the machine? Hand count. <laughs> I'm trying to think how it's going to run through the count. machine. <laughs> that one's a hand. Okay. Secretary of State wouldn't put that one on a on a machine. Yeah. Right. I like that. And, and we can really let people let us know what they think. Should we keep it on Tuesday? If not, Here's your teacher is. Yeah, I'm. I think it's I like that. Very positive. Send him doodle bowl. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it doesn't Sometimes work it works. <laughs> Sometimes it but doesn't it doesn't work. work for those of us that don't get internet, you know, out there in the rural area. Yes, you, you know. do. Just call Stratford. Oh, yeah. yeah. Call, call, call Stratford, yeah. Plug me in. I need to vote. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we need to go back up and finish new business. I drew a box around it, but that didn't mean we discussed it. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm coloring my page and got confused. But I skipped uh, short and long-term goals discussion. So this topic was meant to provide some feedback um, and direction on what we want to focus on as a board. What do we want to see focused on? immediate versus longer term um, projects that some of us knew were going um, that I think got stalled and to give Adolfo some direction on where we would like to see some town focus mm -hmm. so he's not out there beating the bushes and trying to come up with it on his own <laughs> So a few of the things that I've heard to kick it off, I guess, is um, that we need to try and figure out a way to provide some more support in the economic development realm. We had the position identified in the town plan, the economic development chapter. Mm -hmm. We've identified some funds um, to help pay for that apportion, but kind of what we think you know, it's easy to say economic development position because that's a buzzword. 
but what is it we want that position to do? What is the, you know, what are the tasks that we're looking for? One of the areas I think that economic development in Vermont falls down on is any type of help for the smaller business folks. You know, we see it with the LED Dynamics move, Freedom Foods, you've got folks that come in that'll help write grant applications and do all that. The Small Business Development Corp is there to help write business plans and whatnot for some of the smaller businesses, but there's really not anybody there to help shepherd those people some. Yeah, the ability to get small businesses to write grants is pretty critical, and I'll share with you why. So the other day, I think a week ago or so, I received an email, and there was a grant available to take your, I don't know what the age factor was, but they're writing grants to take XYZ year diesels off the road. So I don't remember exactly what the year was, but I had two qualifying trucks. So you have to write a grant application to get that done. Well, I'm not a grant writer, and nobody in my office is a grant writer, but you know, this could be potentially worth as much as $20,000 to our business to be able to, you know, remove a carbon burning truck that, you know, they could replace with a more fuel efficient type of vehicle. And apparently this is happening around the state because there were certain examples that I heard about where, you know, it's a fuel oil dealership that had just a regular deliver oil delivery truck. And, you know, it was like a 1998, I think, and they took it out of service and and he got twenty something thousand bucks to buy a new energy efficient high you know clean diesel unit so but I don't have the ability to write that stuff, but if there was a person in the community that you could go to who could you know help you could get some assistance for this kind of stuff, I think it would benefit a lot of businesses and I'm sure there's more programs out there because I get brochures in the mail from Efficiency Vermont, and they want to come you know assess the building and figure out what to do, but you've got to write the grant and I'm just not that's not me mm -hmm. so I don't know if we had, and actually we did do a little outreach, and there's actually a person in Burlington who they had recommended, and so you know we're going to set up a meeting with that person. But you know here I'm working with somebody in Burlington when we I think we really should be having this person locally. So I think that would be one of the things that this economic development position um, could could work towards. And but I'm not sure that the challenge with that though is what's the town's role versus well, what is like I, the Chamber of Commerce or somebody like that's role. I don't know that it's the town's job to provide somebody to actually write the grants for the business. Or to provide assistance and put them in that direction is what I'm thinking. I think it is their job to help educate folks on what's out there and mm -hmm. and what to do and who they could go to for to help, help for, writing for help it for that. or whatnot. Exactly. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a difference there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe that person, maybe this is kind of what you were alluding to, but maybe I'm saying it slightly more directly, um, Trini, that it would be a person who is sort of constantly searching for these sorts of grant opportunities and identifies people, businesses in town which might benefit and actually helps facilitate those connections also. Right. So that would be the particular expertise of that person would be knowing the business community with, within the town and, and being able to support them in that, in that way. Because otherwise, you have to come across these grants sort of happenstance. Right? Like, how did you How did you find out about it? They sent an email. I don't know That's where they got my name out. from. You know, came but out they, the select board. They sent an email and just yeah, simply the select board. I saw DMV. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. You know, gonna, do you think they, they probably registered. went in? They did a search and they said, "Okay, you know, here's who's got vehicles that are sure. you know beyond 2001 or whatever 2006." Yeah, yeah. And at that point in time, you know, they said, oh, okay, this, these, these companies qualify, so we'll send them an email and say, hey, you're interested in, you know, taking that 2001 international out of service. I'm assuming that's probably how it happened. No, they can't sell your data from DMV. They can't sell, they, but they must have, must have, must have. It's select board. That's how you so, get it. Is that how you get it? Okay, well, whatever. So, anyways, it's, it's you know, so there's a, it's an opportunity for a business, and, and apparently, you know, if it, I don't know how they keep on perking up, but. To me, those are those are valuable things. If that money's sitting there, we should be able to, you know, help businesses find that. And so there may be other opportunities. I know, you know, my conversations with Trisha Follett up in Morrisville about what her role was for that community. I think is kind of a model that we ought to actually be exploring. Um, you know, she acts as a coordinator of all those different entities. She's involved with the Arts Council there. She's involved with the, you know, the chamber that's currently left. And so, you know, she brings the arts people together. She's working with the town's recreation department. You know, they're putting all these things on in the park. They have the summer-long series up there where they're bringing all those people 
but she's also tagging all the businesses because she's using those businesses to help sponsor those events that's going on up there. And I think that's the kind of person the chambers are struggling to even survive. So a lot of this stuff is falling back onto this. A lot of the conversations in the R3 meetings are, that are being had are have, we're having representatives show up here from Brattleboro, from St. Albans, sharing with us that that's what their roles are in those communities. They're actually working on economic development and their, and their town employees in those communities to bring those people and those businesses together for sponsorship and these other kind of projects. Is that the email from Deirdre Ritzer? Probably. Is that the one? Yeah. Sounds I like it, it. I got it two days ago. I got this one last week, yeah, so. So anyways. So then, I think there's also some grants that come to the town mm -hmm. that we struggle with managing that that position should be able to help yeah. do also. Um, and I think they also ought to be able to work with the different groups in the community when we do these uh, public events that seem, sometimes you see them and you're like, why isn't this group involved or why isn't that business here? That yeah. would make sense for them to be here. That's because there isn't that one person that's able to say this, this, and this should all be at the table for Give this. Give me an example. Okay, so we, we're going to get that stage race, right? That's mm -hmm. coming. It's going to be it. It's going to start at the high school. It's going to end at Ayersbrook Groat Dairy. But there's nobody really, there's no cohesive effort to work and support that to get people over there other than the biking community. But, you know, right now there's an opportunity over there to provide services, you know, food, you know, whatever, you know, that part of that's missing because we really don't have anybody that we can turn that fellow over to and say, hey, work with this person because they can bring the community together to help you with this project and, you know, shows us as a, you know, more vibrant community. So we're missing that little element because right now it's falling upon Miles and I to try to figure out how to drag enough people together to, you know, can we get Sarah at the Black Crim to participate? Can we get, you know, one main to participate? You know, so we're just trying to figure out, you know, I'm willing to throw up a tent, but who are we going to put in it? And, and I think if there was a community person involved with that who's doing what this Trisha Follett does in Morristown, I yeah. think it would be a benefit. Yeah. And, and I mean, Heidi has done some things like that, right, where some rec, rec sponsored activities. She's gone out and found people to, you know, businesses to help to write be the part checks. of that. Yeah, be part um, of that. But it would be nice if, if that was something that she didn't have to do. Um, she has lots of ideas about stuff which is more directly rec, which would be great if she could focus on, take that, that piece of that off her. It's like sponsorship for the Little League field. How does that happen? It's because the Little League people go to the businesses and do it, right? But you have it used hard, to be that way. It used to be that way, but it's a hard it's a hard sell, right? It's hard to get that now. So There's a lot of people ask for money now. Yeah, a lot of different entities that are, I mean, I'm, we get hammered all the time, you know, so I'm just doing in-kind services and it seems to work for everybody, but yeah. I'm just thinking that, you know, this person, that, Trisha's role in Morristown really impressed me as to what she was able to bring to the table for the town, which really is working for the entire community. So, and Adelpho, did you ever talk to her? Did I did. Yeah. yeah, she and I had a very long conversation about how she started with Morristown, how her position kind of went from like part time to it was part time. It was a couple days now. a week. Yeah, <laughs> she she was going through a bit of a tiff with the town manager at the time, so she. Rented a little bit about him, and I said, "Well, conversation for a different time." But, <laughs> but she was very, yeah, she she was very willing to share some of the work that she's already doing, some of the strategies that she's doing, and then also said that, you know, that she, she was a little, I think that she was kind of a, a, a diamond in the rough that Morristown kind of found because she just kind of grew for the position and and thought that she didn't really have a job description. She just created it as you went along. So it was a little hard for us to get that from her, but she offered to help us build something. Build something similar to what she does there. Okay. So this, this is the goal that we've been talking about in one form or another for a really long time now. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we're fairly close in terms of finding money for it. Yep. Um, is, is, I mean, what's really standing in our way at this point of just making this reality passing the town plan right that's because that's what's in the town plan well i don't think we need to pass the town plan to make anyways this happen. well no we, we can move but the town plan really does 
put the teeth in it for sure because that's what the town plan that sure, says. Sure, but I'm just, I'm just. But wondering. then said like, that for this, years. this seems yeah. like well, that it has. This seems like it's like uncontroversial, right? People want to see this happen from yeah. lots of different areas. Yeah, lots of different entities. So, so what's what's in our way? How do we just make this fi finally do this now? So I can say that we have. We had budgeted for the, the executive secretary position of forty thousand for the year, um, but some of the savings that we identified, you know, through just uh, consolidating the services, we only had to borrow roughly about five thousand of it to compensate for Shannon's current salary at part time. So we have roughly about thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars. Take thirty remaining for that position plus the fifteen thousand that the economic development committee offered to. And they committed use. that. Yeah. So now we have roughly about forty-five thousand dollars. So that's just for a portion of it. We would have to find the salaries portion of it. Now, if we made this a contract position, uh, three years with the potential ability to make it a full-time town position after that, we could find a way to get away from providing benefits, and we could be an immediate. You know, we could find somebody right away, and we could do that because it's a three-year contract. See what happens from there. And in that time, we could work to find more money to make it a salary benefited position in the future. Uh, but in terms of having a salary without the benefits, we could find that right away. Salary with benefits makes it a little bit harder to do. And how much do you anticipate the benefits would cost? Depending if they come in with a family or not, roughly about yearly, maybe fifteen, fifteen twenty thousand dollars. It just seems like we should be able to find fifteen thousand dollars. That's what I think. So I'm like, you know, put happen. it in the budget. You know, this is we're talking less we than. We do have the twenty thousand in the economic fund each year. Yeah. That's one of the others I have listed. <laughs> we also still are in the middle of union negotiations. Yes, I understand that. So. And they want the world. Mm -hmm. well, everybody does. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I'm supportive of So we need a job happen. spec yeah. that needs to be developed. So what exactly do you want this job doing, which is kind of what we were just yeah. hashing out. So, so I guess from my perspective, there's two things. One is I like the update to the town website, although maybe the town plan can be more visible. <laughs> right? But I think uh, an outreach to let people know about Randolph somehow, right, would be beneficial. Um, I know that sorry, uh, squared thing is is going and all that other stuff, um, but getting getting Randolph out there a little bit more once we figure out what our message is, and then the other thing is you know we as a company in town um, are trying to focus and trying to find you know positions to fill um, from folks. And it's really hard to hire you know skilled labor, so we reach out to VTC. I get people there in <coughs> Norwich. Um, you know the local school RTCC does a good job of placing students through some of their programs, but on the uh, high school side, not so good. But but making that connection between young people in the town and town opportunities, I think, would also be beneficial. Um, That's why I'm going to try to keep people interested in yeah, you know, organically from because I would bet you know I've got four kids and one of the four wants to stay in Vermont, right? <laughs> kind of thing right now. It's it's hard. Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm going to build a ski tow. Yeah, right, exactly. Okay, because those are the kind of things that it's going to attract, and I believe that will bring people to the community and keep the people that are here now. So, and so, I will tell you that the amount of support for that is somewhat overwhelming. I mean, yeah. since I launched that last Sunday night, you know, my Facebook page has got over, I think, 100 likes on it. The town, you know, when you, uh, whatever it was called, you remember Randolph went or something, has got something like 130 today, and the comments are just staggering. And there's letters to the, um, Marty's received some letters coming from people in support of the project, but the single overwhelming thing that seems to be coming out of this is the fact that it's about creating something for families to do here. So, so when we talk about that, you have that project. We also have a growing group of people on motorized sports. Right, so there's, yeah, so there's that whole and getting thing. some of the class three right. roads opened up. Oh, like dirt bikes, ATV type stuff. Well, yeah. more along the lines of ATVs, UTVs, that kind of thing. There's been, you know, Braintree just recently opened up some of their class four and class three to motorized recreation. Um, 
Barnard has done that, Stockbridge has done that, Ridgewater's done that. And so there's just certain areas where there's private landowners who are allowing, you know, <coughs> that type of recreation to happen on their property, but they need the connector pieces to be able to put it together. So, you know, Barnard, Stockbridge, and Bridgewater, I believe, you know, connected a lot of what's going currently going on over there that's run by the, whatever they call themselves, I think the quad runners or something, and they're part of VASA. And so, you know, I've been over there numerous times, and, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, you can get around the countryside, you get up on top of the mountains, doesn't seem to bother the neighbors much, you know, we, they've got speed limits on the roads, and, you know, every now and then you see the sheriff over there, and so, you know, then there's some enforcement going on. Um, but I think that could be a, I think Trini's right, that could be another asset to, that we could bring to the community for some of those kind of folks. And there's a lot of folks here that own those things. You look at the areas of, like, Upper New Hampshire, and it's huge. They don't survive without it. Right. Up there. But, you know, we bought property in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, specifically for this. And you can sit there in the afternoon and watch them go through, and there'll be a hundred an hour going through. And they'll all be lined up at the local store. They'll be at the restaurants. They'll be everywhere. It's huge. I don't think you're going to see that here in Randolph. But I think it no. would be good to be able to connect, like, the uh, campgrounds to the dirt roads. Yeah. to let them get out to certain areas um, over our direction. You could get on the trails, some of the trails that are there, and then the dirt roads and get over into Chelsea where they're really clamoring for people to use the restaurants and they just got gas back in town, which was a huge thing. You know, this type of recreation would bring a lot of users for those type of services to these small stores. Yeah, and, and we'd see it on the snowmobile trails, right, coming to... Yeah, you know, in the wintertime, that's, that's a tremendous, you know, boom for the Vermont economy. And, you know, the summer part of this is actually doing a lot for the same reasons. So, and like I guess I, I don't hear any grumbling. I've, you know, poked around Barnard a lot and Bridgewater and Stockbridge. And, you know, there doesn't seem to be a lot of objection and to, to the, what's going on there. And, you know, I was actually shocked to hear the brain tree decided to open up some, but it's, it's a great thing. It came, that recommendation came from their Conservation Commission. I actually had a conversation with Tom Cooch about it, and, you know, he felt that they needed to give it a shot. So maybe we can do the same thing. I mean, we do it now for the snowmobiles in the wintertime. You know, we're granting access to certain third-class... Class fours. Class fours, yeah. you know, so that they can, you know, continue to move around. So... I think there is a trail that crosses the state highway across right. the right. That's a, that's been there Anderson. for years, and it's a major connection for the vast system to be yeah. able to get, you know, back and forth from east to west here. So yeah. my house there. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's the Vice Christopher's. I mean, that's yeah. that's a very popular trail when there's oh, yeah. snow. That there's a lot of riders that you know that make that cross back and forth. Well, they can get gas too, though. Yeah, and they were yeah, and and that's a you know has been a major economic driver to the barn. Or before that, Rinkers. So, Rinkers you know. used to pay the uh, fuel bill for the groomer. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Rinkers used to, to exactly. Them to groom Rinkers all used the way to pay to back out. pay for the oh, pay really? for the fuel yeah. for the grooming because it was so beneficial to them. So, yeah. yeah. So, anyways, yeah, that would be certainly one to take a look at. So, you know, we can have a conversation with Braintree and chat with them about where. You know, are there things that they've got, areas right now they've got that could connect to us that we could probably figure out how to move forward with? So. Um, one of the projects that was underway was updating all the town's policies mm -hmm. and then putting them online so people could see them and, okay. and know what they were doing. I don't know where that, that's not one of the glamorous ones, but. It would help us in certain cases um, when we were dealing with one of the cases with the PD. We went looking for policies and they were scattered everywhere. Yeah. Um, that's what I think started that initiative of trying to pull them together, update them, and get them electronic. But I think we lost that. Yeah, I did hear it was, it was one of the items that I do remember, Mel mentioning to me before he left and there was a large folder of this size in one of his cabinets. Um, there was a company that came in and talked to us and it wasn't much. It was like 5,000. 
yeah. for them to take them and update them and send them back to the board to consider and then put them out there. One of the other things I think we need to do is define the roles and responsibilities between the town and RACDC. Mm. And we had that question, I think, at the last board meeting. If mm -hmm. There was a couple folks that were interested in working on that, but we didn't get any volunteers. Um, so they had sent back a thing saying they wanted to have that discussion also. I don't know what the most productive format is for that, but I think it would probably serve everybody if we got that a little better defined. And yep. Oh, I have no problem having conversations with them. I've had some here in the past, so you know, it's, that's the direction we want to go in. I'm more than happy to sit on a committee to do that. There's been some change in their board of directors too, so. Who knows what the direction is, but so yeah. I'd be interested in sitting and talking about that. If that's what, if anybody wants to join me, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, they have invited town to either visit one of their board meetings to talk about the relationship. Um, I think one of the challenges is if more than three board members, three more board members or more, attend a meeting, it has to be warned and. That whole thing happens. Um, I think it's one of the challenges is how do we get their board and their director to speak with the board and our directors without the formality of a meeting, and it's almost impossible to do that. So we should, we should just do it. It could just be a special meeting, and our select board, um, and town manager, and RECDC, executive board, and you know, director and like the meeting could just be that. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be a good place to start. Could and we then, do a little? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mike. No, and, and then if and then, I mean, I doubt we would go, you know conclude all you know possible business in one one meeting, nor would we mm -hmm. want to. But um, but it could certainly give us a, a framework, an outline, which then we could we could work on either two of us or you know, just you know or something else but just uh, it seems like getting getting something in place where we can reform a framework of, of, of how we're going to work together it seems like mm -hmm. it could be really productive I was just going to say that because we probably won't get it all done in one meeting maybe a board board member in Adolfo does some of the legwork ahead of time to kind of see mm -hmm their goals and objectives and mission statements and things like that so we can have a better idea sort of ahead of time. A, a, yeah. Sort of come up with a, an agenda yeah. ahead of time working with them. Yeah. yeah. And the background data. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Do some homework. Hmm. I could do that. Is there Someone yeah, Mike, if, Mike just volunteered. Oh, he said Perry said him. Oh, so. I'm more than happy to do it. I mean, I don't have the history that, you know, some of you have. I mean, I'm starting at a different point. So, you know, I, whether or not that's valuable or not, I don't know whether it's good to not have the history or have the history. So, but I'm more than happy to, you know, sit down and have a conversation. I think I know enough about what we want to, or what I think, what we want to see, but I, you know, certainly can start someplace. And they have been, you know, part there have been conversations with them as in, in relation to the R3 process. So, I've already been involved in some of that. So. And, I'm, and I've been part, part of that R3 process. With right. And two of us coming to those meetings. Right. Maybe we could, I could join you guys. Yeah, do that together. That's fine. Sure. You know, Larry's got a little bit of the history. I, you know. Yep. So. Okay. That Let's work? set it together. Yeah. Okay. What else do folks have? What else do folks have? For forty thousand dollars, that's probably all they can do. <laughs> oh, that's a different position. Oh. <laughs> This isn't still on that one person's. 
<laughs> well, I was hoping Heidi was going to stick around, so I'll share with you some thoughts that I've got. I'm not sure whether they're, but they're the part of the goal process, but I'll give you a little over, overview of what I'm thinking with the Skeeto project. So this Skeeto project is an opportunity that I saw that um, it's not about me making any money. It has nothing to do with that. As a matter of fact, I personally would just as soon see an entity own it, take care, you know, take it under their wing. Um, there's been discussion that we've had about creating some form of partnership with the recreation, town recreation facilities. You know, it's not much different than the skating ring or the soccer field or the tennis court. Um, but I know that had something not happened fairly quickly, that, that property could have gone into a development situation and there would be houses sitting there instead of what I've got envisioning. So <clears throat> my hope is that um, we can do a number of things here. One is um, form either a nonprofit or a co-op with this that I can actually turn it over to and uh, get it to that point where it can be sustainable. There's been a tremendous amount of people who have been willing to contribute a lot of stuff to make this happen. Um, I've got people who said they'll step up to the plate with dollars. I've got people who are willing to do in-kind services to get it running. Bill McGrath recently offered to provide all the lighting for the hill, and he would pay to put it in place. Um, so I've got right now um, a company out of Sunapee, New Hampshire called Star Lifts, who came yesterday, looked at the hill. They've got a used handle toe that they could install where in approximately the same location where the other lift the old lift used to be um, my intention is to leave what's there because I think there's a tremendous amount of historical value to that and so um, they also suggested we put in a little small child's rope toe on a certain portion of the hill which they were more than willing to kind of lease to us at a relatively inexpensive cost to get the thing up and running about a thousand bucks just to have that was just like we'll set it up and you know, you can have it for a thousand bucks, and if you decide you want to own it, we'll sell it to you, you know, relatively cheap. So, <clears throat> anyways, that's we're going to move forward with this. We do have to get an Act 250 permit, which we've started the process on that, and we have a development review board hearing next Tuesday night to uh, talk about, you know, what we're going to do up there. Um, I've had no opposition from anybody up there on the hill. A um, couple little quick letters only concerned about the lighting issue, but, you know, we assured them this wasn't going to be, you know, seven days a week and, you know, every day. So it may be something along the lines of what other areas have done. But my hope is that, you know, this could become a joint venture between the town and a nonprofit to actually run it. So this provides, you know, kids in the area the opportunity to learn how to ski or snow tube or whatever they so desire because that is something that I know for a fact is out of the reach of a lot of families here. So I think this is a perfect opportunity to bring back some history and create something here that uh, could certainly, I believe, benefit the community. No different than the skating rink or the tennis courts or the pool, which we need to fix. But anyways, that's, that's the goal there. So that's where <laughs> I'm at with that. So if I could find a swimming pool, we'd buy a swimming pool. But... <laughs> Right now we got a lift opportunity here. So, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the history of the hill. A little bit, maybe. So, it was an operation from 1936 to 1966 and, and then was uh, taken, taken out of service and Pinnacle was created and then Pinnacle went belly up in 76 and so at that point in time there was no opportunities. But anyways, there is now, so. Yes, you used to be able to jeep up Pinnacle. You did, summer. yep. You used to be able to jeep up Pinnacle. As long as you didn't get caught. Yeah, as long as you didn't get caught. So. <laughs> but anyways, there. this piece of property does border the Ellis Town <laughs> Forest. And one of the things that we're chatting about doing is having the parking lot available for summer use so that the parking lot could become the trailhead for that part of the recreation area. And also in the wintertime, the parking area could certainly be used to access the Ellis Town Forest for snowshoeing and cross-country skiing or whatever. Fat tire biking keeps on popping to the surface. Say. That's popped up a number, a number of times, and I've been talking to Zach about that, and we think that's a, you know, if that could be a possibility that that could be launched from there because that would be a great spot to take it off to. So maybe that Ellistown Forest property, you know, becomes a fat tire biking trail, which is turning to be, a, it's a big deal. 
right? I don't do it, but everybody tells me this is huge. I, I don't know how big it is. It's big. But <laughs> it's, it, it hopefully will be. I'd love to be yeah. able to get out there so. more. And it's not going to happen with the other people do it too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so anyways, so that's... So that is something that I would love to see the town become involved in. So how we get there, I'm not sure yet, but I think it's a really good opportunity for, for, the, for not just for us, but for, for the other two communities, you know, Braintree and Brookfield kids too. So that's the goal here. So. Good. Any other goals things you want to see done, focus on? Okay, moving on to manager's report. Okay. Uh, try to be brief. We've got a large list here, but I'll keep it short. Uh, the first is I, I attended last or this week's meeting of the Fire Advisory Committee. I uh, spoke with the members about a potential tabletop exercise for emergency management. Um, the committee was open to having this tabletop exercise, so now we're working with Vermont um, uh, Emergency Management to see what their next steps are for planning this exercise. Uh, we would include fire, police, Gifford, school district to plan something out with the uh, eventual, well, the next step of having an, a live exercise in the spring. So we mobilize firefighters, mobilize police, mobilize, mobilize everyone to uh, run through the motions. The railroad participates mm. in those type of exercises sometimes oh, too. That's if this is all scrap. Oh, you're just putting here? Okay. This is where mine going, I can check in with oh, the railroad this, this is, this and ask is them to come in. Okay. Some of that stuff sometimes if you wanted it to involve. Okay. okay. I need to speak with them anyways about railroad street, so it gives me a good excuse. Yeah. So. Two different people, but. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's uh, one approach that we, we have uh, an update on the swimming pool repairs. Uh, we know what the issues are. Uh, we know that um, they're going to cost some money. Um, we are working, uh, I've asked Bill to work with Marty to build an RFP for everything that we need to repair in the swimming pool. We have roughly about $50,000 identified that would be available to repair the swimming pool. Um, as soon as we complete the RFP, we'll bring it to the board for review. Um, but the, the work that needs to be done um, includes... Uh, new refinishing of the inside of the swimming pool. Uh, we've knocked that down because the full glazing of the inside would roughly be about $100,000. Oh, my God. So now what we're doing is just certain... <laughs> we're going to do some spot painting, which is not a full glaze of the inside, but just waterproof swimming pool paint that will seal whatever micro cracks are available, you know, within there, within the pool itself. It's actually not the biggest problem. We didn't uh, feel that the leaks were actually within the actual structure as opposed to the pipes. So um, the project also includes full replacement of the pressure pipes that go all the way around, uh, or a, a section of it in the, I believe it would be the east, southeast portion of the swimming pool, uh, just replacing that section. And then also pipes for the skimmers that actually clean the water as it sucks it out. Pressure goes through these pipes to circulate the water back in. Uh, and replacing four major heads that are on the deep end of the pool that were initially put in for potential expansion for water features, that, things of that nature. Um, we're hoping that the bids come back at, uh, you know, within our budgeted amount. Uh, if it doesn't, then we'll, you know, we'll try to find money elsewhere. But the plan is that we are going to have the swimming pool completed and open by next summer, by the date when we normally open the swimming pool. So that's the update with the swimming pool. Um, I have recently met with Casella. A, a representative came in to speak to me about um, a change in the state law that now allows waste disposal companies to charge for recycling. Um, one of the issues that apparently they are facing is that China is no longer purchasing some of the items that they were collecting in order to make it easier for these trash collectors to continue to collect the recycling. The state allowed uh, these facilities to charge to accept certain types of recycling. Uh, as a way to compensate that, the companies are saying, well, we were charging a lot for trash and nothing for recycling. 
but now with this change in the law, we're allowed to actually charge for recycling, so we're going to decrease the cost of trash disposal. Um, and it's apparently a way to keep them from going under. So I've asked Casella to come in and present to the board of what their plan is for our transfer station. The agreement that we have with Casella says that they are allowed to make changes to the fee structure if they give the town a 30-day notice. I said, don't make any changes until you've talked to the board, and they've agreed to come to the next board meeting to brief the board on their challenges and what their proposed new pay rate would be. Uh, so that should happen if the board approves for the next select board meeting. Um, we had the first meeting of the ad hoc police uh, evaluation committee. Uh, we have the second meeting coming up. First meeting I felt was productive. Matt, Larry, um, we were both there. We had some members volunteer to bring back some information, including ways, to, alternative ways to fund the police department, um, crime data that um, is collected by, by um, state to, state's attorney's office, and to continue evaluating data as opposed to evaluating options. So we want to see what the data is for the town um, and see where the data leads the committee and what decision would then best work for the data that's available. Um, I believe the sheriff's department is also working on collecting data to present to the board for in time for the next meeting. We have worked with our partners in VTrans. The, our partners with VTrans declined a grant that we applied for that would provide us with sufficient funding to repair the culvert on Beanville Road. It is not an imminent danger of collapse, but it's a culvert that we should address relatively soon. Um, VTrans is aware of the financial pressures. They've allowed us to extend the existing grant that we have now an additional year. They had already extended it an additional year beyond the the life of the grant. They've also allowed us to uh, work with some value engineering to make it to make it structurally sufficient, but also not as grand as was initially proposed. So the way it was described to us is that we were being given the Cadillac of culvert rep replacements, but we really just need a Ford. Um, so we're being allowed to work on recapturing some of the engineering money that was available before to re-engineer the project and then work forward finding more money for the culvert replacement. So we're working with them, we're keeping them well aware of what our pressures are and they're working with us. So we've got a good relationship with them. Um, East Randolph Hall, we had the community group show up today. We're meeting with them on a regular basis. They're aware that $400,000 for repairs to the hall is not easy to come by. Um, so they also are aware that they are not going to get in the hall this year, potentially not next year, um, and they're okay with it now, uh, so long as the town continues to work with them and help them through the process. So uh, we're going to continue to work with them. Uh, I have a meeting scheduled with the Vermont State Police uh, regarding our policing issue with the town. I don't know what their offer is, but I've heard that they could potentially be interested in some kind of partnership with the town. I have spoken with um, Chef Boniak, so he, he is aware that I'm having this meeting. I didn't, didn't want to make him feel like we're blindsiding him, even though he's helping us out at the moment. So he's fully aware of what's happening. Um, uh, but once I have more information from state troopers, you know, um, I will share it with the board. Uh, it could potentially be that they could offer a similar offer that Waterbury received, which is... Um, Two officers, 80 hours per week at $365,000, but I, I don't really know what they're going to offer or if they're even going to offer anything. Uh, so we're still working on that, and I'll share what I what I get from them with the board. Uh, the Vermont Council on Rural Development has asked the board to recommend someone from the town to participate in the Vermont Community Leadership Summit. So if there's anyone that the board feels would participate in working with the Vermont uh, Council on Rural Development on this particular committee. Um, they're open to accepting anyone that the board feels can work with them or would benefit from being a part of this summit. I could, you know, just tell them what the board is considering it. And they say what the summit's on. Uh, Leadership. <laughs> doesn't get a local leader to participate in the Vermont Community Leadership Summit, making it happen. Local leadership for the future of Vermont communities. This would be held on October 1st at Castleton University. 
I could I could bring it back up again for the next select board meeting if, if the board wants have some time to think about potential options and then we could are they looking for a certain age group that we're targeting or are they looking for they just there just someone that they feel the board would be okay yeah no no specific range just someone who would, the board would want to recommend Sam do Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> I have been following up with the one home roads um, initiative that I think started bef well before I arrived. Um, we do know that there is roughly just under three miles of road that if you were to go through this process would be taken off of the town's class three road system and we would receive less reimbursement from the state. It, it, it wouldn't be very much. I don't have the exact amount, but it would roughly be two, three, four hundred dollars that we would receive less. But the benefit to that is that our highway department finds it very difficult from time to time to plow these one home roads because some of them are very long and they do lead into areas that would be difficult to actually turn around and then come right back out to the main highway. So um, they're having to back out yeah. on a lot of these. Yeah. Which makes it dangerous. Back right back out into the regular traveled streets with yeah. their equipment, and they can't see. They're basically driveways yeah. that the town has, and for whatever reason, we have them as class threes. They should be class fours, right. in my opinion, because they're not traveled lanes for anybody. And if you pull in, you feel like you've drove into somebody's house mm -hmm. yard so, because that's how they use it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's our options are two. We can change them to class four, mm -hmm. which then we don't maintain them and whatnot, or we can throw them up, which means we just give them up altogether. They don't even become class fours. How, how come we're, yeah. we're still dealing with this? What, what was the... We never started the process to change them. Because I remember, we, this has been going on for yeah. quite a long time now. Yeah, a year. Oh, this is... It's been a, a whole, year? A year, yeah. <laughs> this has been talked about for 20 years. Yeah. No, but we, we <laughs> talked... You, but you guys started this before? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just sort of... We got them all identified, and mm -hmm. that's about as far as we made it. Okay. So now, what is the process? So do we want to try and get this done before Spend winter so that... I would think we would, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's a goal. I... <laughs> There's a goal right there. You're right. <laughs> Short term. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a real tangible goal. And it's big because some of these we have to either send a truck over, a pickup over, because the trucks can't get in these yards. Or in a few cases, it's a loader that we send over. So they drive from the Randolph Center garage over to the Chelsea Mountain Road with a loader to do some of these. Huh. And, they, and they wouldn't fit our current road standards. Right. At all. Right. We not, wouldn't take right. them on. You wouldn't take them on if they were. Right. Okay. Because we require at least three properties and some other stuff, right? Yep. Yeah. I'll certainly follow up with, and I know the process is in the orange book for VTrans. I'll follow up with the process. Um, I could certainly work this year to, to get the ball rolling. And I think it's going to be the quickest for us to just change them from a three to a four. To a four. Because throwing them off, we got to go back and do the land record research. Mm -hmm. Why did we end up with them to begin with? Mm -hmm. Whatever. Mm -hmm. well, a lot of them were so. through. So if there's there's no, that were abandoned. There's no really good reason like to not take the easy route like you can something. go to class four and our maintenance responsibility is done while we go through the rest of it even if we wanted to just give them mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. okay all well, that is one of the goals uh and that is all that i have for this meeting for the manager's report Next on the agenda is executive session. I move me into executive session. Second. And by Adolfo. And by Adolfo. Motion in the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries.